Okay, let's make a start. Um, welcome to this conference. My name is Michael Devera. I'm the director of the Oxford University Centre for Business Taxation. And this conference is on reigniting pillars one and two prospects for reform. So we have uh, a large number of participants actually from all over the world. Uh, we're in the UK. Uh, we, I know that we have people joining us from as far afield as Australia late at night and California early in the morning. So this is uh, really a worldwide event. Um, the title of the conference, Reigniting Pillars 1 and 2, actually comes from and stems from a conference that we held in November of last year, also on Pillars 1 and 2. And at that point, we had uh, several members of the steering group of the Inclusive Framework uh, talking about the prospects for agreement. And one of the big issues at the time was what would be uh, the attitude and proposals put forward by the new Biden administration. Um, and there was a consensus that, you know, whatever went forward would really depend quite heavily on that. Well, the Biden team has certainly made an impact and certainly made some proposals. There have been dramatic extensions in what they're proposing for Pillar 2 and, and minimum tax. They've abandoned the safe harbor proposal for Pillar 1, um, but want to restrict Pillar 1 to uh, only the world's very largest companies. So we're hoping to learn more today about the state of play negotiations uh, of both of these positions. Um, and among other things, you know, from the outside, it's interesting to think how, how far are these proposals, real proposals or an opening bid in the negotiation. There's also been activity outside of the OECD. So a couple of weeks ago, for example, the UN approved the final version of its article, uh, new article 12B of the UN tax treaty um, on income from automated digital services. And uh, the European Commission has plans to introduce a new digital levy, uh, which it says it will bring forward proposals for in June of this year. Um, since agreement on Pillar 1 is in principle, at least, uh, depending on it replacing the digital services taxes, then you know, these kind of questions raise quite a big issue of you know, what the US and other countries think about those proposals and, and how that will affect um, the prospects for agreement within the OECD. So at this conference, we don't have a speaker from the US uh, government, but as usual, we have a first class lineup of uh, speakers from around the world. We've got three main sessions. So first of all, I'm gonna be speaking to Pascal Sanderman from the OECD and Mike Williams from the UK Treasury. And after that, we're gonna go into two sessions. One, the first one on pillar one and the second on pillar two. So we have, as I say, an outstanding lineup of uh, speakers, and uh, I'd like to thank them all in advance for being here. We'll introduce them in, in a bit more detail when we get there. Um, for any participants who would like to ask questions, then the way to do that is through the question and answer function in this webinar. There are currently well over 400 people, so if everybody asks questions, I think we probably won't have time to get to them all. Um, but I will certainly be monitoring that and my colleague John Vella, who's going to be chairing one of the sessions, will also be monitoring that. And where possible, we will uh, put the questions that we see in, in, those, in that Q&A to uh, the uh, speakers. So that's by way of introduction. Uh, I don't want to spend too long with introduction. Everybody knows why we're here. Um, we're going to start with Pascal Santaman in... I go to conferences and quite often I hear somebody uh, being introduced as saying they have no need of introduction. In many cases that may not be true, but in this particular case it is. Pascal is the director of the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD. He is the man who has been uh, leading the biggest reforms in international tax in a century uh, for the last decade or so. Pascal, so uh, Thanks very much for joining us. And maybe you could just give us a, an update to, to begin with on, on where we are with the negotiations and the discussions. Thanks, Michael, and uh, good whatever to, to you all, as I understand you're joining from all over the world. Very happy to be with you. I, I think, uh, Michael, you were right in the introduction to say that uh, the negotiation was kind of rebooted by new proposals by the US administration on both pillars. I would add, even though this is under pillar one, uh, also a request to work seriously on uh, unilateral measures for a standstill and the rollback of these measures, which should be part of a 
package, as members of the inclusive framework made it clear that this was a package, pillar one, pillar two, and in pillar one, a new allocation of taxing right, a new nexus, tax certainty, and a, a, a standstill and rollback of unilateral measures. So where, where do we stand? As you know, in spite of uh, the um, uh, safe harbor proposal, which was made on the 5th of December uh, 2019, we've kept the work alive. We've been able to come up with blueprints as a way to show that yes, there was work uh, uh, possible and there was an architecture for each pillar. We did the public consultation and out of the public consultation, we clearly identified uh, that uh, pillar one uh, was considered probably rightfully so as extremely complex uh, from both tax administration, by both tax administrations and taxpayers. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we have waited for a new US administration um, um, view on this. Um, what I think we have all been struck uh, by is how forceful the uh, US uh, approach has been, and, and it's forceful because it's part of the US domestic agenda. Uh, we have seen that uh, President Biden uh, makes uh, the uh, tax issue one of the markers of his presidency, or at least the beginning of his presidency, uh, for both high net worth individuals or, or individuals in general, but also uh, for multinational companies with extremely strong language. I even had some phone calls from, from some countries, members of the inclusive framework, uh, continental European country, which is not a member of the European Union, you will guess who, asking me, well, is there something in particular against us because we were ranked as a tax haven by the presidents of, of, of the US. So what does that mean? So very forceful, very, a strong narrative uh, by the US. What, what, what is it about and what's the impact on our process? It's about primarily, I think, uh, tightening the so-called guilty rules, uh, putting in place a strong uh, mechanism to have a minimum tax on the foreign profits of American companies uh, through a move uh, to a jurisdictional blending, that's our jargon, a country by country approach for uh, um, evaluating, uh, assessing the minimum tax and, and shifting the rate, uh, lifting the rate from 10.5% uh, to an objective of 21%. And, and that's, I think, what is central to the US approach and out of which uh, derives, one, the fact that the US for objective and obvious competitive reasons, uh, would like the rest of the world to have uh, as uh, an, an ambitious uh, pillar two, as ambitious as possible, with all its components, the income inclusion rule, the under tax payment rule, the US talked about the shield for their domestic uh, legislation reform, but, but a strong mechanism uh, with subject to tax uh, rule as well, so that uh, you have a critical mass of countries joining pillar two. We all know that pillar two doesn't require uh, consensus. It doesn't require all the countries to join. It's more of an common approach. Uh, interested countries can move. They are bound. If they move, they should implement this. Uh, and, and others not moving would recognize the legitimacy of the mechanism. That's the logic. So what derives from uh, what seems to be uh, one of the top objectives of President Biden for the domestic agenda is getting the rest of the world to, to, to agree an ambitious P2 by ambitious you have uh, the blending, and that was part of the inclusive framework um, uh, blueprint, uh, but also the rates. Some, the French finance minister, for instance, mentioned a 12.5 rate. Now people, I think, uh, start thinking that uh, uh, with the US moving from 10.5 and global blending to possibly 21% and the national blending, 12.5 may not be the right benchmark. And, and interestingly, we heard the finance minister of Ireland, Pascal Donahue, uh, who so far had been very negative on Pillar 2, opening the door for Pillar 2, but saying 12.5 is, is, is an Irish marker, uh, which, which uh, cannot be uh, overcome. So good dynamic of the negotiation. But with this objective, I think the US realizes as well that there is a need for pillar one because that's a package. To get a pillar two delivered, you need to have a pillar one agreed. And on pillar one, the US 
has come up with what I would uh, qualify as, as a promising um, uh, proposal. Um, uh, in French, you would say interesting, but interesting in English doesn't mean the same. It's, it's little interest. So no, this is a promising and reasonable and, and I think um, um, uh, a proposal which has stimulated members of the inclusive framework. As you said, it's about to take the, the US narrative about the winners of globalization, the top 100 largest, most profitable companies in the world. The, the benefit of that proposal uh, is, is at least twofold. One, uh, uh, complexity uh, can be trashed with that proposal, because if you take a, a whole company approach, if you're in scope, you're in scope for all your profit, uh, then you can trash uh, the um, uh, business line segmentation, which was the complex thing. Maybe you will find some exceptional cases where uh, you may need to keep uh, business line segmentation. Think of the cloud business, no need to name any company, but I think it's pretty obvious. But, but at least uh, uh, when business line segmentation was the core of, of, of the difficulty of our blueprint here, it, it becomes something uh, marginal. The second uh, merit, I think, of this proposal is that it's in line with the bipartisan position expressed in the US since the beginning, which is you cannot ring fence the digital economy. But at the same time, third merit, when you look at the companies impacted and when you look at the pool of profit, it's a pool of profit which is globally similar, and we're working on this and it depends on the criteria which would be ultimately agreed, but we have a pool of money which is not different from what resulted from the uh, CFB ADS scope, Automated Digital Services and Consumer Facing Business uh, scope, and, and, and most of it or a significant portion of it would come from what politicians would uh, assimilate to the digital economy, even though uh, uh, some companies are digital and were not caught by digital service taxes, which I think was one of the weaknesses of the DSTs uh, from a political perspective. Uh, the French GAFA tax is actually a GAFA tax because it doesn't catch some of the, of the digital companies. Now, the, the potential difficulties of the US approach is that it's, it's new, uh, uh, it has to be looked at, uh, some may consider that, that it's a limited number of companies when developing countries, for instance, insisted on having a 750 million threshold or even below. Here we would be, I mean, at much higher levels. But uh, so far, the proposal made by the US, I think, uh, has been, I think I can say welcome at the steering group meeting and the task force on the digital economy meeting. So a very good dynamic. And, and, and it would come with the idea that People need peace. I mean, tax peace. It's been years we've been talking about that. I think people recognize that the digital economy cannot really be ring fence and, and, and is not, I mean, what is going to pay for COVID, that the money is on pillar two and that trying to find a solution, getting rid of the section 301 investigations where they are still going on and try to find uh, uh, this move to um, uh, what you would like, which is recognizing that further profit should be allocated to the market jurisdictions with a new nexus for pillar one and the safety net to put an end to the race to the bottom with pillar two and peace with no longer Section 301 standstill and rollback of unilateral measures is a brighter future than, than a fragmented system with countries moving on their own. That's the promise of an agreement. The timing is challenging. It has always been challenging. There is a meeting of the G20 finance ministers in July, hopefully in person in Venice. Uh, there will be another G20 finance ministers meeting in October, mid-October. So I think with these two um, 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 meetings, uh, we, we have room to have an agreement which would hopefully, if not stabilize the international system, at least bring peace, which is badly needed. Okay, thank you very much, Pascal. It's a very broad and swift overview. That's, that's great. I, I have a stack of questions following up, if I may. Um, I mean, maybe we could start with um, some of the pillar two issues. So I, it seems to me that one of the kind of big things which is different between the US, what the US is proposing and what was in the October blueprint is the substance carve out, which seems to me to be asking the question, you know, is pillar two really looking at profit shifting with the substance carve out, or is it really trying to go for, to limit tax competition and really have a minimum tax rate? Um, 
that, that's one part of the question. I, I guess the second part of the question while I'm while I uh, asking this, you, you said we don't need everybody to do pillar two. We need a, some kind of critical mass. Could you expand a bit more on what you think the critical mass is or needs to be? Uh, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, on your first question, uh, I think the, the answer is putting a safety net, putting an end to the race to the bottom, which is a way to address the remaining BEPS risk. Uh, and, and countries are sensitive in the way we phrase this. So I would say it's, it's putting an end to uh, the race to the bottom by addressing the remaining BEPS risk. Uh, and then I hope this is compromised language, which can bring everybody to uh, an agreement. Um, the substance carve out uh, is being discussed. There is a, a draft uh, in, the, in the blueprint. Uh, I think that uh, the US can move on its own and, and, and you will have seen from uh, their own blueprint that uh, they don't plan for uh, any carve out uh, while at the global level, I think it's not realistic to think that we could move ahead without uh, some form of carve out, which would recognize uh, uh, the um, uh, activities, the substance, but we're moving away from the harmful tax practices logic, which is, oh, you have substance, you're fine. Uh, it's, it's no harmful. Here, the logic is to have an objective criteria to have something which is uh, pretty abrupt. It's, it's, it's an effective rate, even though uh, you, you, you may have some form of carve out to recognize uh, that a number of countries want to incentivize research and development, and, and, and that should be recognized without emptying uh, the objective of pillar two, uh, which is to have a robust mechanism uh, to ensure that multinational companies would face a minimum level of taxation on their profits abroad. Okay, thanks. Can I just push it a bit further? Because when I read the American proposal on the kind of made in America tax plan, it's, um, it seems to be about, you know, concern about American jobs and offshoring by American companies we don't want American jobs to move offshore, which is which is very much about kind of moving a real activities. It doesn't seem to be a kind of BEPS type agenda. It, it seems to be something slightly different. I, do, do you, do you, I, I think you confuse, you're, you're confusing, I mean, one, the political rhetoric to the consequences of a policy and, and, and the way you articulate the policy. Uh, these are different things. One of the consequences of putting an end to the race to the bottom, maybe that businesses will restructure and accordingly may bring back jobs uh, uh, in the US. And that's the issue of the substance. One, one of the criticisms which could have been addressed to BEPS or which is addressed to the BEPS work is that we said, we're gonna realign the location of the profits with the location of the activities. And, and in some cases you will have seen that the activities have followed the profit when one could have thought that the profit would actually follow the activities. Uh, and, and that was um, one of the reasons why uh, Ireland could see, uh, has, I mean, so its uh, GDP increase massively uh, uh, following the, the BEPS implementation. So I'm, I'm not sure that there is any contradiction in what you're pointing. I didn't respond to your second question, which was on the critical mass of countries. The, the logic of pillar two, is not to say we need everyone in the world, because that would be contrary to the principle of sovereignty. If a country wants to tax its own companies at 9%, which is the nominal rate in one of the inclusive framework members, uh, Hungary, uh, their choice, sovereign choice of the parliament. The issue is, what if this is used by companies to reduce their tax burden in their, in their, in, in their overall uh, tax planning. And, and it's also a matter of sovereignty for countries where companies would be headquartered to say, we want to take a difference. There should be a minimum. I mean, it's, it's kind of a limitation of the principle of territoriality, which I don't know when it was introduced, probably in the 60s. Uh, I remember the French and the blue train, as they call it, where, where they floated this idea. Uh, and and, and uh, there is a limit in a globalized environment where it's very easy to shift your assets, your profits, your even your people to say, well, we need, we need, I mean, territoriality is fine, 
but we need to have uh, a safety net. And, and in that logic of protecting the sovereignty of countries in both sense, not imposing on countries to adopt a minimum rate for their own businesses, but allowing countries to protect their own tax base on their own companies uh, when they act uh, and when they uh, do business abroad, you have this logic of income inclusion rule or under tax payment rule with possibly the subject to tax rule as a complement. And, and, and with that, what you need for this to work, to have an impact overall, not to have massive um, uh, inversions uh, because you would have only a limited number of countries having moved there. What you need is what I call the critical mass. You need most of the capital exporter countries to move, but if they don't move all, then you need a large number of countries to do the under tax payment rule. And with that, I think you can reach the goal of ensuring that, yes, globally, profits can no longer be taxed below a minimum rate, which is an effective rate to be determined. Okay, thanks. I, I have one question which has come up in the Q&A from Stuart Gibson. I'm not sure if you want to answer this, but it's, it's, it's Stuart asked, could you please elaborate on your comments about Ireland opening the door on pillar two? No, I will not. I think the question <laughs> should be addressed to the Irish authorities. I don't. Right. I have a, a terrible French accent and no Irish accent. Uh, so ask ask the Irish. Okay. Well, let me let me pose a different question. Moving to pillow one then, and and what the EU is doing. You know, if so, I you know I know that the the idea of pillow one is we can get rid of the DSTs, um, and that's that's clearly the the aim. It's. I guess there's two there's two issues here. You know, do do you think that a, an agreement along the lines of what the US has proposed will ensure that countries who have DSTs will get rid of them? And in particular, I suppose thinking the other way around, you know, if the Commission goes ahead and says we're definitely going to have a new digital levy, will that make it much more difficult to actually achieve agreement on pillar one? So the the the, the first question, I think the answer is in the question. There will be a deal if everybody's satisfied enough, which means that uh, countries will be happy enough with a reallocation of taxing right resulting from the deal on pillar one, which means that they would uh, stand still on unilateral measures or, or roll back the existing ones. Uh, and, and the US will, will agree on the deal if there is this standstill and rollback. So it's, it's core to the deal. Now, if there is a failure, there is no deal and, and, and we'll see what happens. So it's, it's really core. Uh, I, am I worried there? Not really, uh, but, but you know, things, uh, I mean, the, the, the proof of the cake will be in the eating. It will be in the work we'll do to come up with objective criteria to identify which measures uh, would be in contradiction with a, a deal um, or not. So that's, um, uh, that's to be seen. As regards the uh, European Commission, I could hear some uh, English accent from a country which did the Brexit and left the European Union and therefore would be very suspicious against the Commission. Uh, but joke apart, Michael, um, the European Union was in a position a couple of years ago to say if the OECD fails, we're going to do our own thing. Last year, in July precisely, the leaders of the European Union, when they established the recovery plan and, and the plan to pay it back and to uh, uh, rely on own resources to do so, and identifying own resources, came up with a suggestion in addition to a border carbon adjustment and plastic tax with a so-called digital tax. And they were still in, if there is failure, we need to do our own thing. I think there is a recognition by the European Commission, if I read well what uh, Commissioner Gentiloni has said uh, or written, or, or Yerasimos Thomas or Benjamin Angel to mention the, the, the three key people uh, there, that the European Union does not want to disrupt any negotiation at the OECD, which they see as, as very important, uh, which they support the success of, uh, and uh, therefore don't want to be disruptive. Uh, they hope that there is an agreement, and therefore what uh, they intend to table is something which would 
meet the objective or, 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 or satisfy the objective of the own resource, which is to bring a lot of money. We're talking about many billions and, 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 and I think it's 17 billion euros, something like that. It's very significant and digital companies on their own through DSTs cannot pay for that. Look at what France is collecting. I mean, it's 350 million from its DST or 400 million. It's, it's really not much. Uh, so the European Union Commission, I think, has in mind, one, not to disrupt, two, to bring money. And how can you do that? Probably by having some form of, of sales tax on, on the category of transactions, which would sound like digital, online sales, or, or, or other, I mean, automatic digital uh, services, uh, or, or sales of goods uh, online, as I mentioned, which would mean a very broad base, low rate, no threshold, I don't know, I haven't seen any draft, but that's what I could imagine. And that would not be discriminatory, I guess, from a US perspective, or I would imagine it would be designed not to be considered as discriminatory from a US perspective, and therefore not disturbing the negotiation at the OECD. Uh, it's, it's all the more important, I think, from a EU Commission's perspective that if they disrupt the negotiation, if there is a risk that the US triggers a section 301 investigation on an EU Commission proposal, the EU Commission proposal will be dead on arrival, which is not the goal of the Commission. The, the Commission needs to make a proposal which will bring money to, to fund the own resources. So the risk, I think, is limited. I'm not too worried uh, there. I'm not worried at all, I must say, even though Again, the devil is in the details. We need to look at the draft and, and that will be a conversation between the new commission and the US. But as you said in the introduction, there is a new dynamic, a very positive dynamic. It's about peace. It's about constructing or reconstructing trust with the positive vibes. And that's where we are today. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to hear all that. The, I let me let me just finish on the, with these questions with um, well a question about you know how successful you think this is I think you've done a fantastic job in bringing everybody together all the parties are there you know in the inclusive framework sitting around the table you've been very diplomatic in the way that you framed this I think you know how confident are you that you're going to reach an agreement in the next weeks and months. What do you want me to respond, Michael? I'm not confident at all. This is going to fail. This is terrible. There is no agreement. No, I mean, I'm paid to be optimistic. So yes, it's it's likely that we get an agreement. And it's not only because I'm paid for that. It's because countries want an agreement. They don't want um, uh, trade tensions. Uh, there is a way out. There is an open US administration. There is a reboot of the negotiation on both pillars with a proposal on pillar one, again, which, which reflects a bipartisan view, which means that the chance of implementation by Congress, which is also, I mean, an important dial in, in any negotiation with the US, this tick the box of, of, yes, it's bipartisan. It's no ring fencing on pillar one, which is very important for the credibility of the negotiation. And pillar two, I, I think, you know, what, what makes me very optimistic is that we, 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 we did in the 90s harmful tax practices work with upsides and, and serious downsides, which was at the end, you validate regimes which become even more aggressive in terms of of, of, of competition. They're no longer harmful as per the OECD um, uh, judgment, but, but they become much more aggressive. Uh, so that's how we started it. And then with BEPS, we tried to close a number of loopholes. And I think we've done it. I mean, hybrid mismatches, uh, uh, interest deductibility limitation, and, and, and definition of the permanent establishment. And even on transfer pricing, which is not the most successful BEPS action, we've made uh, significant progress. And during the BEPS conversation, the idea of a global minimum tax emerged. It was not right enough. I mean, countries were not uh, uh, mature enough to, to get it. And what makes me really optimistic is that it's the Republicans in the US, who are not the best friends of, of high taxes, who introduced a global minimum tax with guilty. It's the beginning of a global minimum tax. But frankly speaking, who would have thought that the Republicans would do this? Now, you have kind of the last mile, which is 
turning a global minimum tax, which still allowed for tax planning with, I mean, you know, mixing up French tax with Cayman non-tax with the logic, which is, no, we want to eliminate uh, this type of, of, of um, arbitrage and, and, and location of profits to zero tax jurisdiction. So when you put that in perspective, and when you look at the alternative, I think that failure is no option, and that's why I'm positive that by October there will be a deal, and uh, that uh, uh, will have um, will have uh, yes a package agreed. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us and, and presenting thank that, you. and uh, you know, wish you the best of luck for the coming negotiations and weeks and months. So, thank, thank you, you Michael. Much. We need we need luck and we need your support. Thank you. So thank you. I'm going to, I'm, we're going to move on to um, get the, uh, a perspective from Mike Williams, who is uh, Director of uh, Taxation in, in the UK, uh, Director of Business International Tax in, in Her Majesty's Treasury in the UK, has been, is a, a veteran of, of negotiations uh, in the OECD in, in many different fora. Um, and so we're going to kind of move from Pascal, who's kind of been sharing the whole thing to you know, more of a country perspective. Um, so, so Mike, again, thanks very much for joining us. And maybe you could just start by, you know, giving us your view on the overall perspective of, you know, where, where we are from your perspective. Uh, th thanks, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm afraid there may be noise in the background because miraculously uh, I found my way into the office today. Uh, at least this is a positive step forward. I, think. Uh, I didn't, uh, I'm afraid, hear, hear the first two minutes of what Pascal said, but I find myself unusually in agreement with, 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 with much of the rest, which is, I think, encouraging. I mean, start uh, in terms of encouraging. I think the change in US administration is very significant. There's a welcome change in the mood music. I think it's helpful at a so-called safe harbour proposal, which uh, in reality was an optional tax has been taken off the table. I think it's fair to say it didn't appeal to other countries. I think that the proposed changes made by the Biden-Harris administration, the guilty rules uh, are distinctly to be welcomed. Uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, we certainly are up for looking at the quantitative approach put forward by the US to see if it offers a quick way through uh, on pillar one. As ever with the US, the big question is, can the administration get legislation needed through Congress? Uh, and there's no getting away from that. I mean, that's the reality. Uh, and it's not quite the same as, say, in the UK, where, you know, the Johnson government has a majority of 80. And you, why, why in those circumstances wouldn't a proposal get through? I mean, it's not like that. Uh, and I think we have to factor in uh, that it's not like that and indeed uh, make allowances for it. I mean, I think the, the, the core UK proposition is that we've got to solve the digital tax issue, uh, which we've been working on for years. You know, Pascal rightly touched uh, on that. You know, it's not going to go away and we do have to solve it. And if we don't solve it, things will get worse. You know, I don't think the status quo is, is remotely stable. I think it's not just uh, and not primarily about minimum tax. You know, minimum tax might help, as long as it works, uh, uh, to ensure that businesses pay tax. But it actually matters as well, of course, where tax is paid. Uh, you know, and I know you live uh, near Coventry, Mike, and you know, in terms of providing uh, schools for the children of Coventry, it, it is not actually tremendously helpful if more tax is paid in California when it ought to be paid in the UK. You know, that will not bring schools to Coventry. It's not politically acceptable if uh, tax is not being paid on a fair basis. So I do think we have to do with uh, the allocation of profits as well as ensuring uh, a minimum tax. And it seems to me if we're not able to do that, then there's a strong sense in which the international tax rules are not capable of being updated, which I think then of itself creates a problem. Uh, you know, that said, you know, we've always said that, you know, we uh, are quite willing to take pillar two as well as pillar one as part of a consensus deal, recognising that the other countries are much more interested in pillar two, but will take pillar one. But I think it does have to be on that basis. I don't think that there's some sort of, oh, you know, let, let's not bother with pillar one anymore. That yeah. doesn't solve the digital problem. It leaves us with a problem tax being paid in the wrong place it leaves a significant unfairness so we do have to address that 
Uh, and I'm, I'm moving on to pillar one. You, it does have to cover digital issues satisfactorily. You, I, I recognize the point that Pascal said about difficulties in ring fencing the digital economy. But on the other hand, equally, a solution that doesn't deal with the digital economy isn't really a solution at all, considering where we started from. You, I think we do have to recognize, uh, for example, the role of users in terms of adding value. You, I, over the weekend, uh, re rented a cottage in Derbyshire. Uh, and the most interesting thing, I was asked to review this cottage almost the minute I set out at the door. When I left, it was almost as if there was some sort of infrared trigger that made sure that the renter was asked to provide a review uh, almost the instant they left. Well, that is all about the user generating content, you know, the reviews that then create more uh, buyers. You know, there isn't much else there, candidly. You know, if I don't do reviews, if others don't do reviews, what exactly is the platform doing? Which, of course, is why they're so desperate to get your views. Uh, we're also up for going more broadly, so long as we're able to do so on a fair and consistent basis. And I don't think we've got any particular problem uh, with covering, say, 100 groups, as the US has proposed, so long as that doesn't create significant distortions. Uh, on pillar two, I think you know, there's obviously the question of what is the rate, which we'll no doubt uh, come on to. There's also the coexistence with the US guilty rules. I think that coexistence, frankly, is very difficult where you've got the guilty rules that in effect provide for worldwide global blending. How do you get coexistence? You, you, you can't in it realistically work out what the comparable rate is. It all depends on the circumstances. It all depends on whether the multinational has a pool of high tax profits as well as, well as relatively low tax profits, or if it doesn't. You can't easily create a level playing field, uh, and I think that matters. I mean, and also if if you take a specific example where it's less about the competitive aspect of it, but you know, in truth, coexistence. What to do with a UK top company that has a US subgroup? So under the Pillar Two Globe proposal, the income inclusion rule applies to the UK top company. Uh, now. I'm pretty sure that the US would take the view that we should relieve their guilty tax that the US subgroup should pay against the income inclusion rule. Well, it's not probably that obvious why we should do that, but let's suppose for the purpose of this argument that we agreed to, how would we do it? We don't know how much of the guilty tax relates to the US uh, subgroup uh, on a country by country basis. We can't look into the workings of the guilty rule to work that out, the guilty doesn't work on that basis. It just comes up with a global number. Well, you know, there's nothing there to tell us how much we would, would, would have to uh, give relief for if we were going to give relief on a country by country basis under pillar two. So I think it, it is enormously helpful, I think, that the Biden Harris administration proposal on pillar two moves it much, much, moves the guilty much closer the globe proposal on the pillar two. You know, I think you can get much more true coexistence. I think equally, you know, back to what I said earlier about the US, we don't know what the US Congress will pass in terms of legislation. We don't yet know when. So I, th I think that then plays into the debate about the minimum rate. And we may have to be in a world where we sort of say, well, if the US sticks with the guilty rules operating globally, the minimum rate is X. But on the other hand, if the US does move to operate the guilty rules on a global basis, sorry, on a country by country basis, then it's possible to conceive of a higher minimum rate, you know, not least because you can get genuine coexistence, you can make a comparator. Uh, I mean, let me just then comment on two final points and I'll, I'll stop and take questions. I think on unilateral measures, I think there's an important piece of work on unilateral measures. I mean, we have always been clear that our digital services tax, which uh, as you all know is now in existence, will be abolished uh, when the long-term multilateral solution uh, is in place. So when pillar one uh, is in place. Uh, we, we've uh, been quite upfront about that. We have no problem with that. Uh, clearly that would have to be part of the bargain. You know, that said, you know, equally, I think we're not up for giving all sovereignty away on tax. Pascal touched on sovereignty, right. You know, what if in the UK we wanted to introduce a packaging tax? You might find, considering where much of the packaging comes from, that packaging tax was levied primarily on US-based groups. Does that make it discriminatory? Uh, is it discriminatory if, if the reason the packaging tax applied most to US-based groups was that they put most of the packaging on? Not obviously. 
uh, equally, you know, let's say we needed, uh, let's assume the guilty rule stay on a global basis, which creates room for mixing uh, between high tax and low tax. Posit a group that has a lot of high tax, so it can reduce its guilty tax, its overall tax bill without a guilty hit by reducing its UK tax bill by siphoning off profits for a tax haven. Uh, that will be possible in some circumstances with the current version of the guilty rules. Uh, if the US, if the UK were to take counteraction against that, inevitably that counteraction would be primarily be against US groups. Is that discriminatory or is that just the UK reflecting its sovereignty faced with uh, a challenge to that sovereignty from the US guilty rules operating in a way that's not contemplated for pillar two? You know, again, uh, not obviously. So, I mean, I think the, the issue with unilateral measures would be to determine which ones uh, and on what basis. And I think that's quite a tricky issue. Uh, final thought, I think fitting it all together is tricky. What's the sequencing? Nobody is going to give everything away before they get their part of the bargain in return. Uh, but that links to when does the US legislate and on what precise basis. Equally, how do we fit the different pieces together? You know, the need for treaty cover under Pillar 1, which is difficult to attain with the US. Equally with Pillar 2, what about businesses affected by Pillar 2? If there is no legal cover, so there is no dispute resolution. I mean, sure, there might be peer review, but if you're a business faced with two charges uh, under Pillar 2 by separate countries and you think there should only be one, kind of peer review isn't much help to you. So, I mean, I think that that is another aspect. But again, I mean, the final comment where I do very much agree with Pascal, sticking with where we are is not viable uh, and, and will not be stable. We do need, I, I think, to update the rules to create stability. But let me stop there. OK, uh, thank you very much, Mike. That's that's very helpful. Um, can I just come back with a couple of questions again on pillar one and pillar two? So I, I, I guess the starting point would be as you say, the, you know, the UK's DST, you've been very clear that, you know, this is a temporary measure until there's some agreement, you know, more worldwide with the OECD. So I, I suppose the kind of natural question then is, you know, under the US proposals, it looks like um, the pillar one would only apply to a really very limited number of companies. Uh, and I think you, you were, I think you just said, you know, that's okay. Um, that, that would be, would that be enough for the UK to say, okay, you, you, we've met uh, our, our target and we're therefore willing to get rid of the DST in the UK? Well, I mean, the DST also applies a to a pretty limited number of right. companies. I think the big question, is it applying to the most significant companies and is it doing so in a way that doesn't create very significant distortions? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, that would be appropriate. But I, I think you know, bearing in mind the inevitable complexity with Pillar 1, which was rightly flagged in the consultation, you know, applying it to a larger group, so a smaller set of groups, it is, I think, more viable in that sense. Uh, but you, I think it's possible to do that so long as the, the main digital players are covered uh, in a way that addresses the concerns that the DST is directed against. Okay. Um, so, okay, on, and on pillar two, so, I mean, looking, you know, over the last few years, the UK has been relatively competitive on tax rates. We've reduced our tax rates down to 19% and it's going up again now. Um, but we've, the UK has kind of taken, you know, a reasonably aggressive competitive position saying, come and invest in the UK, we have low tax rates. You, you, you're, I mean, the UK is sort of willing to forego that um, as part of a deal. And, and I guess, you know, part of the question in my mind would be, would the UK be then competing on other kind of dimensions rather than just the tax rate, for example? Oh, well, I mean, I think we've always been clear that we compete on more than tax rate. You know, right. we compete in terms of having good good infrastructure, in terms of having a, a well-educated workforce, uh, among, amongst other things. So, and equally, in reality, I don't think people are going to stop competing for mobile uh, foreign investment. But I think the competition hopefully will be more based on the substance rather, rather than just uh, on tax, although I don't think the UK has ever just competed on tax. I think it's, it's you know, we are more interested in pillar one. We've always said we're more interested in pillar one, but on the other hand, we, we've also said all the way through 
that we accept that there are other countries who are, who are, who are keener on pillar two uh, than we are. And to get a deal, we have, we have to have both. And I think that remains the position. Okay, thanks. And can I just, um, well, go back to something you already said a bit already in, in terms of the kind of minimum tax. So I think there's a, you know, there's a way of thinking about the minimum tax that says, okay, well, if, you know, if everybody in the world goes to 21%, say, you know, then we've solved most of the world's, the most of the problems of the international tax system. But you seem to put your finger on uh, something which it doesn't solve, which is the allocation of taxing rights in a sense. You know, is this multinational going to be taxed in the UK or Cal in Coventry or in California? And that seems like a big problem, which is still going to arise even, you know, you know, even with a complete agreement on both pillars one and pillar two. Do you, but it would, does that mean that further reform is going to be needed anyway? Well, I mean, I think it would arise to a significantly lesser extent, provided we get the deal on pillar one as well as pillar two. Uh, and I think it, it's never realistic, you know, back, back to your point, Pascal, does everybody have to adopt pillar two? It's never realistic to search for the perfect solution. You know, the perfect solution probably has no compliance costs. You know, you sort of deem them to be zero. But in the real world, there are significant compliance costs and those compliance costs you know, will, will be greater, for example, under pillar one uh, for smaller businesses than for larger businesses. Uh, and we should factor that in because it do, does it impact uh, on efficiency. So I, I think that matters a lot. As to the rate, I don't think we know what the rate will be. You know, so the US administration has suggested a 21% guilty rate, but you know, we, we have no guarantee that the Congress will move the guilty rules to a country by country basis, nor that it will be 21%. So you know, would other countries be wise to, even if they thought they should be at parity with the US, which I don't, I don't think is, is self-evident, but even if they thought they should, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you would agree 21% at this stage. And as Pascal said, there are other countries that have significantly lower rates. Uh, and that has to be factored in as well, because we do need to get as wide as deal as possible, I think. Yes, okay, thanks. And I, I mean, I think I would certainly take many of the points you made about what in effect is the coexistence of guilty, you know, whether or not it's reformed and, and whatever pillar two turns out to be. Just, uh, just one question on the, um, which came up in the Q&A about pillar one from Sol Picciotto is, about you know, further sectoral exclusion from pillar one. So I mean, moving, if we kind of move to the more of the US position, I guess the question is, you know, so Sol's question would be, would there be any, or would you favor in, uh, any sectoral exclusion for pillar one from, for example, in, our case, in the UK case for banking and finance? Well, I don't think that is in the UK case. I think if we look back at the pillar one blueprint yeah. issued in October, there yeah. are exclusions there for extractives and financial services. I yeah. don't think, anything significant has changed since then. Uh, equally, if you want a, uh, a deal in a reasonable time scale, and I think there are very good stability reasons for that, I don't think realistically you can include financial services on the same quantity of basis. So the metrics are quite different from financial services. Okay, um, thanks. I've, I've, I've kind of seen a whole range of uh, further questions here, which I, um, haven't had time to go through, I'm afraid, um, but also we, we're running out of time now. We've got a very packed agenda for the afternoon. So um, let me call it a day there, Mike. Thank, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and thank you very much for explaining, you know, the UK's position and, and some of those, you know, really quite difficult problems that are still to be resolved. Um, but it's very interesting to see the kind of positive perspective that you're taking on this. And uh, we look forward to seeing what happens over the next weeks and months again. So again, thank, thank you very much for joining us. I think we have made progress over the last five months and hopefully we'll make more as Pascal suggested over the next five. So hopefully we'll see you then. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Mike. Okay, so uh, thank you. We get, we're going to move on uh, with a, a more detailed look at each of Pillars 1 and Pillar 2 now. Uh, and we're going to start with Pillar 1. We have uh, a fantastic panel and actually, I would like to invite the panel to kind of join me on the screen, perhaps, and um, we can we can take it from there. So let me briefly uh, introduce the panelists who are almost uh, all very well known uh, to the participants here. So the, the, we're going to start with Akin Pross, who is the head of uh, International uh, Cooperation and the Tax Administration Division uh, at the OECD. So uh, Akim is going to give us a kind of slightly more uh, detailed perspective of what's uh, of where we are with Pillar One. 
Then we're going to move to Michael Leonard, who is the Chief of International Tax Cooperation and Trade okay. in the Financing Developing Development Office for the UN, who is going to talk more about the UN proposal, the well, it's no longer a proposal, the UN Article 12b, which has recently been adopted. Then we're going to move back to the OECD with Sophie Chattel. So Sophie is the head of the tax treaty unit in the Centre of Tax Policy and Administration, again, at the OECD. She will, uh, I hope, talk something more about the uh, some of the treaty issues there, um, and in particular, kind of whether we need bilateral changes, multilateral changes, or even unilateral changes. Next on our panel is going to be Richard Collier, who has worked closely with the OECD, uh, particularly on Pillar 1, uh, but is also an Associate Fellow of the Centre for Business Taxation. So I should advertise that Richard, uh, John Vella and myself have been thinking about the kind of different proposals here, the, the Pillar 1, the 12B proposal, and also the RPAI, the Residual Profit Allocation by Income proposal, uh, in the recent book by the Oxford International Tax Group which I should advertise. If you haven't already seen it, then you should definitely get a copy. And in fact, while I talk about it, here it is. Uh, it's available free online, but also you can buy it from, uh, certainly you can buy it online from Amazon and even OUP. Um, and certainly uh, fifth, but certainly by no means least, we are gonna invite T Tim McDonald, who is the Vice President of Global Taxes at Procter & Gamble to uh, to come in and actually comment on, on everything else that everybody has said, but also kind of thinking more generally about, you know, the benefits of taxing the market country. So the idea is each person is going to speak for about five minutes, five to seven minutes, and then we'll, you know, go into some further discussion and questions. So that's the plan. So, Akim, can we start with you, please? <clears throat> Absolutely, we can. And it starts with me unmuting myself successfully. I hope I've succeeded at that. If you're nodding, then I have, yes. <clears throat> Thank you for, for having me. I'll be brief in my five minutes. I guess Pascal has come with the optimism. I come with an overview and then Sophie comes with the answers. Um, and of course, it's all based on Richard's good work uh, that we are where we are. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple of words on Pillar 1. I guess the specific question is not so much, I assume, uh, Michael, what you told me, people know what the pillar is. I'm not going to give you a summary of the pillar. It's a little point. It's more like a question of sort of where are we, what's the discussion, you know, what's some of the reactions to the US proposal and what are we seeing and how are we moving? Um, and maybe doing this, you know, by going through some of the aspects that, that you're familiar with. I mean, we've had for the longest time this question, uh, almost Goethe-like of, you know, what is the scope of pillar one? Um, and as you reminded us, we had a panel where we talked about what might the Biden administration bring. And they have come with proposals. I also see Tim here. Tim's also come with proposals and businesses has come with proposals and the US has come with a proposal. Um, you know, and that proposal, I think, as Pascal said, you know, it's not an interesting, interesting in the English sense, but it actually is an interesting proposal. Um, and of course, you know, some of the public consultation commentators also made similar proposals of a comprehensive scope. If you go through the comments that have come in and also the discussions that we had at the time, I think, Tom, you were also on the panel on what the scope should be and what different variations we have. Um, and certainly, I think the, the reaction um, from many countries in the inclusive framework is quite positive. It's quite positive because, you know, it allows for further simplification. It may minimize uh, the need for segmentation. Some of the challenges around segmentation that we aware of maybe completely eliminate the need for segmentation. That, that's sort of a big one. Um, um, it also, in terms of elimination, there's a couple of other aspects as you get going through the pillar, it does uh, respond to also a couple of things that we haven't just heard from business, but also equally from developing countries. Um, so that's certainly a point to take into account as, as we move forward. So that scope question we now need to discuss, we've heard from Mike Williams, of course, you know, from a country perspective of where are people on the scope. Clearly, you know, from the perspective of those that have DSEs, it needs to solve the digital challenge. And as we've always said, it's the digitalization of the economy. And even when we did the Action One report, you know, we said you can't really ring fence the digital economy. So where does that take you? And so I think, you know, it's taken us some time to, you know, figure out where the scope should be. But I think, you know, that's a crucial question as the economy evolves and getting this right. I think if it takes a bit longer, then it's probably time well invested to have something that also we don't need to change every other year. And certainly 
um, as my team and the secretariat had to draft various definitions of what's consumer facing and what's not consumer facing and what's ADS and what might not be ADS. Certainly there's some attraction of having something that as much as we like come to Paris on a regular basis uh, that we might need to do as business models evolve and we would have to constantly keep up with evolving business models trying to describe them. So I think that's maybe what I wanted to say on scope. Um, you know, it is a residual allocation model of residual profit, so it resonates part of what's in the book, I think, you know, <laughs> and, and the ideas, you find them there, it's a formulaic approach, you know, within the scope, and with respect to residual profit, that's what we're discussing, so, so you have that, I mean, there's also still, you know, situations where residual profit is still or already in the market, do we need to give them additional money, the marketing and distribution safe harbor, the idea that a company already leaves residual profit in the market, well, maybe then there is no amount of allocation, whether that's a net or a gross basis and a withholding tax. I think these concepts are being discussed. It is, and I think there we all agree, you know, it is an allocation also in situations where there is no physical nexus. I mean, that is the key digital challenge of giving taxing rights, even in the absence of physical presence. I think that's what all the proposals do. That's what this proposal does. And it's the question, you know, what's the scope and in what circumstances apply that? But I think we've, we've changed, we've, we've broadly accepted wherever you speak that we cannot in a digital age limit taxing rights to situations where there is a physical presence. I think that's broadly accepted. So we see that. And there's questions, you know, what's the nexus threshold? And it's very clear that when you look about this for developing countries to be able to benefit, that nexus threshold needs to be small so that even smaller economies can benefit. And they can also benefit from having the right source rules. That's a challenge. How do you do this? And I think there things need to come together. I think we need something low so that developing countries benefit. We need then also tax certainty so that this doesn't lead to administrative complexity and double taxation. We need something that has administrative simplicity so that the burden of complying with the low nexus threshold doesn't translate into 10 times as much compliance costs as benefit to developing countries. But these are all moving pieces, administration, low thresholds, uh, simple administrative systems. If I run to the other aspects, I think the basis is financial accounts. Thank you, Richard. I think that's pretty stable as a concept where we work off how we determine what that is. And, you know, there we also see the cross fertilization amongst the pillars that the determination of that financial accounting profit and necessary adjustments, we see much that can be similar across uh, the two pillars. Then maybe finishing off on the two remaining elements, tech certainty. Um, you know, this isn't just tech certainty for amount A, it's also tech certainty beyond amount A to speak, certainly for those in scope, question mark also for those not in scope, and there we need to think about, you know, what the scope now is and where we settle on the scope given the US proposal. <clears throat> I think there is intellectual agreement um, by and from practically all countries around the inclusive framework, a big table, that with respect to this new taxing right that we allocate on a formulaic basis, um, that um, that requires not just a multilateral process in the way it's designed, but that also must translate in a multilateral process in terms of how it's applied. And that does require some form of early coordinated tax certainty along the lines of what you find in the blueprint earlier today, I've revised the next iteration of this that we will be discussing in the task force next week. So the tax certainty is active. It's very clear. It's equally clear that if we want a consensus, we also need to go wider with the tax certainty and go beyond purely the new taxing right. But at least for those in scope, if we want to stabilize it, there needs to be tax certainty beyond and otherwise I don't see an agreement. And then finally, the last part, <clears throat> I guess is how do you manage the administration? We also spend quite a bit of time, it's not in the limelight, but I think it's very important to work and think about the administration because the first thing tax administrations and companies are gonna see in this pillar one is well, how does this work? How do I file? How does all of this work? So we're spending quite a bit of time sort of early in the back office. So what's hopefully a tax policy success doesn't turn into a tax administration failure. And then maybe just the last word and then I finish hopefully in my five minutes. I think what we're trying to do here is, of course, and this is the difficult challenge, and that's why it's challenging. We're trying to do something that is net. So we're not trying to do gross taxation. We're trying to eliminate um, a double taxation in this process. We recognize it is a multilateral dimension in terms of how we determine the profit and then also we apply it. 
So if you're trying to see those objectives that we have, you know, stability of the system, increased tax certainty, taxing net and avoiding double taxation, then it is true that some people say that that is more complicated, but that we would prefer it is then also if we successfully land it, that is actually a solution. So there's many simpler things you do, but if that is what we're trying to do and that is what we're trying to do, then you have some degree of complexity that may now be less also in light of the US proposal as we work through it and we see whether uh, we, we go in that direction. But as I said, I think a positive reception to this, we're working through this. That's maybe a brief um, summary of where we are. I haven't touched on everything, but that's maybe in five minutes and over. Uh, right, thank you very much, Akin. That's very helpful as a, as a starting point. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those details over the next hour or so. Um, let's, let's go on uh, for now to um, Michael Leonard. Michael. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly, I'm, I'm sort of the equivalent of the old television series, not the nine o'clock news, because this is not pillar one. This is the, as Michael mentioned, the UN model tax article 12B, which is uh, going to be part of the 2021 model, which will be published in June. There's a, a, a late version of this on the UN tax committee um, 22nd session site, if you just search for that. And uh, the version with just a, basically a few editorial changes will be on before too long. So what are the central features? It, it's, first of all, it's a model bilateral treaty provision. The idea is similar to, to, to other proposals that allocating taxing rights under a geographical PE rule just doesn't work for automated digital services and that there needs to be an alternative. It taxes payments in your country for automated digital services. It's based on payments rather than, than users. Um, and automated digital services are provided, uh, are defined as a service provided on the internet or other electronic network with minimal human involvement. And there's some guidance because there's a, a commentary on the provision on these sorts of things. So uh, it's a gross basis tax, but, but something that's new for the committee and a recognition of some of the concerns in this area. There is a, a sort of a, a simplified, not simple, but a simplified way of having a net basis option at the taxpayer election. Um, I don't have time to go through that at the moment, but it's an attempt by the committee as it, it hasn't done in the past. The UN Tax Committee has drafted this, not the Secretariat, to have some sort of net basis in cases where gross uh, is uh, unfair to the taxpayer. It's at the taxpayer election. The source rule is that the country uh, at payment is uh, of payment is the country of source. Uh, and unlike the fees for technical services article 12A, it doesn't exclude personal services. It was felt that personal services, which are uh, automated digital services should be covered and, and how the withholding is done can be dealt with uh, by a country, including by a credit card company or something like that. Uh, there's an exception for the provision of, uh, of the ADS through a PE. And very importantly, and people forget this, it assumes domestic law. People often miss that, that it, it would only apply, it doesn't give a taxing right, a, a treaty doesn't give a taxing right. So you, A, you need that underlying domestic law, and that's part of the messaging of this from the developing country people who, who uh, uh, designed it. Uh, and the, secondly, you, you need to actually fully access exert your treaty rights under domestic law. You might, for example, decide you don't want to tax the, the personal services. Similarities to pillar one, well, it's a treaty-based solution with all the pros and cons of that and the issue of whether domestic legislation should be inside or outside the treaty network. It's not quick. Uh, uh, the multilateral is not quick. A bilateral negotiation is not quick. But again, very importantly, the signaling is quick and the, the reference to domestic law is something that domestic law can, can come into uh, effect quickly. And of course, a lot of developing countries who designed this, this, uh, uh, this uh, article really don't have big treaty networks and uh, uh, it would apply even without, if there was no treaty, you, uh, it would apply at domestic law level. So uh, it does away with the PE concept, but uh, remember in the UN case, we already have a precedent. We have article 12a, which did away with the, the PE concept for fees for technical services for much the same reason based on, on uh, 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 developing country practice in particular. Quick 
view of some of the differences. It's just a model. Uh, the good point of that, or one good point of that, is it puts both sides of the argument. In the commentary, it has the arguments against this provision from the, the quite large minority of, of committee members, and it was broadly along developed developing country people lines uh, who didn't like this. It's not attempting to be comprehensive. It's more incremental. Um, it's meant to simplify and focus on specific areas of concerns for, for countries. It's, uh, it's not a multilateral treaty, but we see it as a multilateral development. Um, it's part of the multilateral norm shaping process, and it's a multilateral development that has implications for the bilateral treaties, but also, as I've mentioned, for the domestic law. It's not contrary to any outcome at the OECD or inclusive framework level, despite what you might often hear, because any self-respecting multilateral treaty will provide that it has precedence over the bilateral treaty for, for, the, for parties to it. And as I've said before, we never know, whoever's negotiating a multilateral, we never know who will actually join that. We can't assume that every country is going to join it, even if they actively negotiate. Was developing country conceived, drafted and driven? Um, it seeks simplicity in administration for tax administration. So it has some, some sort of rough rules which are intended not to be perfect, including the net-based option, but we're in intended to be a fair compromise between stakeholders. And I think very importantly, not, not just to the fact that it was developed by developing countries, it's an authentic voice of developing countries and they're banding together more than they did in the past. And that is a, a wider political significance. Um, uh, just very finally, it, um, it affirms the broadly market basis for taxation based on payments, not on user, but broadly market based. Um, and it, it sort of reaffirms that that's not a new taxing right. We never called the, the proposals a new taxing right because the, the ability to tax based on the market is as old as the hills. It's really more a, a more novel allocation of taxing rights of provision than in most treaties in the past. But then even with the UN fees for technical services provision had already taken on some of these issues. It affirms withholding taxes Arguably, it gives less power over interpretation, well, definitely to panels. <laughs> um, it doesn't have its own dispute resolution system, and it doesn't have any uh, uh, criteria as to the size of, of, of which companies are involved in it. So you don't have the issue of what happens for those that are not covered by the provision. So that's really the, the main point. Um, it's uh, 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 an attempt by, driven by developing countries to deal with their concerns, to have something that's <laughs> simplified for them, not just for stakeholders, but also tries to be fair to stakeholders. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. That's very helpful. Um, so with that in mind and keeping the UN perspective in mind, let's return to the OECD. Um, Sophie. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Michael asked me to explore um, whether a multilateral or a bilateral agreement would be needed in order to implement Pillar 1, but also to uh, other proposal, and why. So when I thought about it, I thought, saw two main determinative factors that will decide what is the best implementing uh, instrument the first one is really what are the obstacle to for a country to apply the new proposal. So looking at uh, the obstacle is one thing that will motivate what instrument you need. The second one it's also important because it's what degree of coordination you need in order to implement and operate uh, the new uh, measures as Akim has, has mentioned a little bit earlier. So let's start with Pillar 1. Um, for the first time in history, Pillar 1 really uh, addressed the issue of the taxation of MEs as one unit, one group, and not the, the separate entities within it. So in order to do that, uh, the first thing come to mind is, can we do that under the existing system and the vast network of treaties? We, we're talking about close to 4,000 treaties. So can we do that? Well, if a country tries to tax the profit of a non-resident that is part of that pool of global m and profit, well, it's likely to tax a non-resident on its profit 
uh, that is not attributable to a permanent establishment. So it can do that under the existing system. So then you have to think of an instrument that would remove the uh, treaty obstacle, remove it effectively, as we saw with the MLI, you need um, a multilateral uh, instrument. Otherwise, you, you have to remove them one by one. I'll take time, as Michael mentioned. Uh, but once you remove the obstacle, you also have to think of an instrument that will uh, bring some new parameters uh, in order to apply the new taxing right. Because when we talk about taxing a group a pool of profit, you don't want uh, to remove the obstacle and it becomes the wild, wild west, right? So you need to have uh, some uh, coordination. And so that's the, the, the second factors is what instrument will deliver the best level of coordination? Uh, and for a pillar one, um, has the blueprint mentioned, uh, the best way to remove first treaty obstacle, but then to ensure consistency and certain, certainty in the application and operation of uh, the, the, the new measures is a multilateral convention. And even if you don't have treaties to provide obstacle, you would need that, um, that uh, coordination and, um, and assistance by other jurisdictions that may have the information you need to exercise your taxing right. So for that reason, the, the uh, logical angle to pillar one is a multilateral agreement. Uh, if we move to 12B in terms of implementation, what are the obstacles? And that is an interesting question because um, if you design your tax as a corporate income tax and you tax um, a digital transaction digital, uh, the income from digital services uh, paid to a non-resident, then again, we are in the space of uh, the treaty and then we have a large treaty network that would prevent you to do that without a permanent establishment. So you have to think of renegotiate those treaties. As Michael said, it'll take time. Um, but the benefit of having uh, negotiate the treaty is that at least on a bilateral level, um, as uh, also Michael mentioned, you have the perfect allocation. Uh, you have an agreement on a bilateral level that one country can tax uh, this uh, transaction or the income from digital service and the other will relieve double taxation. So um, 12B is really considering the bilateral approach to, uh, to this issue. Um, now, finally, just a, a quick word on DSC. Um, this is um, designed, most of them designed to be outside the corporate income tax, and therefore the, the obstacles are not as present or not there uh, in the case of a DSD. So, um, so the, the factor number one of what is an obstacle may become political uh, trade sanction that, we, we, uh, that uh, Mike Williams has uh, referred to. So, uh, the, these are obstacles, but that will need to be uh, considered as well uh, over the time, but not for the implementation at this time. They're more political. Um, the um, main element of a DST as well are really under the control of, of uh, the tax administration in terms of, of seeking information, et cetera. But the one thing that I find interesting is uh, in the DSTs are the sourcing rules because uh, this is where they don't have as much control because they're sourcing rule of transaction that occur outside the jurisdiction. And so a certain level of, um, of coordination would be needed if uh, the world was to move into world of DSD. But as we heard from Pascal uh, and his optimisms that I share, we are not gonna go there. So um, in conclusion, uh, two main factors and that will determine the the main instrument, uh, the best instrument to implement uh, your uh, proposal. Over to you, Mike. Michael. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, can I ask a clarifying question, please, before you go? Um, which is, I'm, you know, I'm asking this as a humble economist who doesn't really understand the law pro properly. But comparing the 12B proposal and DSTs, you know, they're essentially both taxes on gross revenue. You know, I, the sourcing is different, as you pointed out, but the you know, 12B is designed within the context of a bilateral tax treaty. DST is designed to be outside. 
So is there anything, can you point to kind of what it, what's the kind of clear distinction between them, which makes, you know, withholding tax under 12B inside the treaty network and the DST outside of the treaty network? Yeah, that is a, a good question, but um, I think that um, the key uh, is that the key parallel will be a, a fee for technical services under uh, 12A. I think that is assumed to be an income tax. So if you design the tax uh, like a, 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 the taxation of a service uh, payment to a non-resident, it's part of its income from carrying on a business, uh, but not through a permanent establishment, and, it, um, and that service is part of the income of the non-residents. Um, if you design uh, your tax uh, uh, like a, a, um, a tax on the service provision, if you provide services in a country and you earn income from that, but you provide those services not through a permanent establishment, uh, then this is where 12A or 12B in the case of digital service would uh, be needed. But if we, you design it uh, completely outside your corporate income tax, and again, it goes through the nature of the tax, and there's a thin line, right? But you could cross that thin line and move into a world of what we call the hybrid type of tax. They're not really based on the income, but they're more transactional, they're more turnover, they're more, uh, so, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question, and there's a lot of literature on that, and, uh, but it's uh, it's fascinating, but it goes into the details of what exactly is the country enacting. Is it a DST or is it more like a, um, a taxation of non-resident on their income from the provision of digital service or services? But Michael may have a better answer. Okay. I... Let, let me come back to Michael. We'll, let's let's okay. raise that again later if necessary. I just wanted to see if there was a kind of clear answer. There's, there's an answer there. I'm not sure I fully understood it, but that's, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna move, let's move on for the moment to Richard, who's gonna comment on in a variety, on a, on a number of these different points, I think. Richard. Well, th thanks, Mike. Uh, you, you referred earlier on to some of the work we've been doing together, uh, that's you, uh, me and John Vella. And uh, so I'm gonna use my five minutes just to talk a little bit about uh, that work and what we've been doing and why we've been doing it. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit different to what we've already had uh, uh, so far. Uh, the paper we've written, which I think has been widely circulated uh, to those uh, uh, participating today, is a comparison of three proposals namely the OECD Pillar 1 proposal, the UN Article 12b proposal, and the RPAI proposal that Mike referred to, the residual profit by income proposal. And we've also used DSTs as a point of contrast in our analysis. Now, obviously, these proposals differ in many and very significant ways, but they all seek to shift an element of taxation of profit to what I'm going to refer loosely uh, to as the market state. So they're all shifting uh, uh, profits to the market uh, in some way. So you might say, well, why have we, why have we looked at them in this comparative way? Uh, well, the first thing to say is that we've not tried to just uh, do this to rank them. That's not been the objective of the exercise at all. Uh, rather, the, the objective of the exercise is to show that contrary to, to the way that they are normally seen, uh, these proposals are more than just standalone alternatives. Um, and what we've tried to do is um, uh, encourage the perspective that they are different attempts to address what is basically the same set of common issues. That's the same, including scope, the mechanism they choose for allocating profits to the market, the nature of the tax base, the collection mechanism, and the country, if any, in which adjustments are made to, to deal with the elimination of double taxation. Uh, so so that, that's what we're doing. Why do we think that's helpful to do that? Because we think it's helpful to show that the uh, differences in the proposals comparatively uh, uh, and the merits of those, the merits or demerits of those uh, differences in the proposals, and above all, the trade-offs that are made by the choices that are made on those central issues in the proposals. 
uh, which are clearly a, a, a really significant feature. The other aspect of this uh, exercise is that it encourages thinking on possible interchangeability of elements of the proposals. And I'll come back to that. Now in five minutes, I can't possibly do justice, uh, at least that's my claim, uh, to what's written in the uh, article, but I'm just gonna mention two or three points and, and then stop. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, in a sense, Sophie's already introduced this theme, it's the decision you make about whether your approach should be unilateral, bilateral, or multilateral. Uh, and indeed, the proposals we look at include examples of all of these. Uh, an example of a unilateral approach is obviously the DST. Article 12B is a bilateral approach. And the Pillar 1 and the RPAI is a multilateral approach. Uh, now, this issue is essentially about the, I think, about the room for manoeuvre, the ability to, to introduce broad-based reform uh, is really what's riding on this, on this choice. So, for example, DST's unilateral uh, mechanism is in principle the easiest uh, thing to do for a state, uh, but there's little room uh, for manoeuvre, and as Sophie indicated, there is all the risk of retaliation and international political uh, pressure. So at the other end of the scale, for much more ambitious reform of the existing system, you really do need, and this is our conclusion, this is one of our conclusions in the paper, you really do need a multilateral approach because you have to amend the treaty network if you want to deliver the wider uh, ambitious reform uh, on a more timely basis. So that's, that's just the, 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 that, that first issue I'm gonna mention. Second issue I just wanted to mention is uh, the way that you might deal with an adjustment um, uh, for the tax that you allocate to the market. And this is, uh, this is the treatment of the credit for the market tax. If we're paying additional tax in the market, well, how do we go about getting a credit for that uh, or basically assimilating it into the existing system? Uh, now, just a couple of comments on that. That, that requirement for a credit or an adjustment may or may not be needed, and that rather depends whether the system is a new overlay to the existing system, as in uh, the Pillar 1, uh, or whether it's a new system altogether, as in the RPAI. Um, uh, if, if it's a new system uh, which is introduced on top of the existing one, which continues, like, like the Pillar 1 proposal, you have to deal with the interaction between the two systems. If it's like the RPAI, where it's a new system which simultaneously deals with the uh, allocation of a routine return and also uh, simultaneously the allocation of the residual return, so that coordination is inherent in that system, right, simultaneously delivers a full allocation at one sitting of the profits, there is no need to deal with any interaction between the two systems. Uh, but where, if we do have an overlay system as in pillar one, and so we are interested in maybe a, a credit approach, there are clearly choices. Uh, you could have no credit as in the DST. You could have a full credit without any kind of distinction between residual or routine profits, as in the Article 12b proposal, uh, or you can have a full credit, uh, or, or sorry, a credit restricted to residual profits, as in the Pillar 1 proposal, uh, which is implemented by uh, basically identifying the paying entity approach, uh, on the basis that the, it is the paying entity that has the pool of residual profits that you're interested in. The other thing, so we looked at all of those different uh, uh, mechanisms uh, and tried to evaluate them. We also uh, gave some thought to a possible system of credit transfers. And now that might be relevant where uh, an approach along the lines of the Article 12B is, uh, uh, the UN 12B is, is used, and the credit is, is, is normally linked to the recipient of a payment. Uh, and uh, in that circumstances, we, in circumstance, we looked at the possible uh, ability of a credit transfer system uh, in, in those limited circumstances, which would allow the shift of credit uh, to other entities in the group. In very broad terms, 
other entities in the group that would, would satisfy the kind of conditions uh, to be a paying entity under the Pillar 1 proposal. Uh, the last point I just wanted to mention is that I did mention this approach is, is designed to make us think more flexibly about the elements in the proposals. Uh, and so this, the last comment I just wanted to make is that uh, it introduces the possibility of mixing and matching, if you want, elements in a new way. Uh, now, we try to illustrate that in the paper by an example based on modifications to the Pillar 1 proposal. Our starting point was that some commentators have said that there may be difficulties arising from the certainty process in Pillar 1 related to sovereignty concerns. This is on the basis that you can't get 130 states in the room uh, to decide certainty issues. And, and there may also be issues uh, arising from the novel centralized infrastructure. Uh, so what we sought to show is that even in that case, uh, you could still apply the essentials of the Pillar 1 approach, including the scope, the calculation mechanics, the revenue sourcing, the thresholds, etc. They could be delivered bilaterally using a delivery mechanism similar to that in the Article 12b proposal. Now, I'm not going to try in the space of two minutes to uh, explain how exactly we've, we've done that. The details are in the paper if you're interested. Um, but very, very broadly, we've converted the Pillar 1 approach into a tax on country ca cash flows. We've ba basically bolted it onto the uh, cash flows. Um, now, it's important to say the trade-offs would be different. Uh, really, the whole point of our exercise is to look at different trade-offs, uh, the existence of different trade-offs and what they mean. And the most critical aspect of what we've suggested or illustrated is that we would lose the tax certainty feature of Pillar 1. Now, that's an important point, um, uh, how, uh, and which we completely understand. But the whole example is premised on the certainty being a difficulty to deliver, which it may or may not be. That's, that's an, an entirely practical point. Uh, but in the modified approach that we've uh, explored, it's uh, easier to uh, deliver the new Pillar 1 system through this bilateral mechanism if those, prof if those problems, sovereignty or whatever, do arise. And obviously they've been, uh, the whole point here is to deliver them, to, to deliver the Pillar 1 mechanism through a more familiar bilateral mechanism, uh, which might, might also uh, remove the constraints on the numbers participating in the scheme as a whole. So the overall point I'm making here is the overall point of the paper. The proposals, the, the various proposals that we've considered are more than just standalone alternatives. And the elements of the proposals can be thought of to some degree as alternative and to some uh, degree interchangeable. They're all ways of addressing common issues, each with their own advantages, disadvantages, and trade-offs. Okay, so it's not that simple then. <laughs> um, thank you, Richard. Um, Right, finally, last, last but not least, Tim, you've been waiting patiently for quite a long time now to have your say. So where's, where's it all gone wrong? Well, I'll, I'll open with thoughts on the US proposal. Um, I think directionally, um, I like the fact that they tried to eliminate some of the complexity of the line drawing of ADS and CFB. Um, I think that was inherently going to produce a lot of controversy and arbitrariness, uh, the noted distinction between diamonds and pearls being within the scope of pillar uh, amount A is an example because pearls come from the sea, were not processed, they'd be exempt. But diamonds, because they come from the ground but they're processed, they become consumer facing. And yet they're both sold in the same store by the same salesperson. That, that looks to me nonsensical. And that kind of issue is pervasive in this line drawing. So I think that's a good move forward. Um, I'm not sure limiting it to 100 companies is sound. And I'll give you observations, legal, political, and economic. Uh, legally, we're in uncharted waters, at least from a US perspective. Um, of the 100, 
Tax Foundation and some other firms have tried to de determine who would be the 100. And the list can vary year to year, but generally it looks like 40 to 50 of the 100 companies of the US and about 60% of the total profits being reallocated would be US companies. Um, from a US perspective, there's a distinction between a law that is discerning and one that is discriminatory. And when you rifle shot attacks in the hypothetical, a special regime that only applies to one company is probably not constitutional, it's probably discriminatory. Can you write a regime that targets 40? I don't know, but it's an interesting problem. Uh, politically, the US is still the majority of the target in this 100. Is that just a different type of ring fencing? I don't know how Congress thinks of this. Uh, additionally, there's a, there's a comment that they may eliminate segmentation. I would suggest that's a huge mistake. There are many taxpayers in the US that have substantially more domestic profit here than they do in other markets. It has to do with the size of our economy, the fact that for US companies, they were here first uh, and are the deepest entrenched in this market. Uh, it'd be politically very difficult to see Congress knowingly passing legislation that takes solely domestic income and reallocates to the rest of the world. And what I mean by that, I'll use P&G as an example. We're, we have 100% higher profitability on domestic sales than we do rest of world sales. And uh, when we had a domestic manufacturing uh, regime in the US before 2017, 94% uh, of what we sold in the US qualified as made in the US sold in the US. And, and yet we would be taking, if we use global financials, those profits and sending them to 140 other countries. Politically, I think that's very difficult and we're not unique. There's, there's dozens of large multinationals that are in that kind of uh, description. Lastly, economic. There's rhetoric that's talking about taxing the largest and most successful multinationals who benefited from the pandemic. The rhetoric bothers me. The rhetoric, first of all, these rules will outlast the pandemic after effects. We're talking about structural global agreements that will be there hopefully for stability's sake for quite a while. Um, secondly, it looks like we're importing individual ability to pay concepts into corporate taxation because whoever's within this scope will have both a higher administrative cost and probably likely a high, higher tax burden. It, it, it makes perfect sense and I'm, I think everyone would agree progressivity means testing for individuals is a reality that's ethical and required because people need to take care of their necessities first. They have to be able to feed themselves, have shelter, et cetera. Therefore, the ability to pay makes perfect sense for individuals. It doesn't make as much sense that we are in effect having redistribution for corporations. We're, we're gonna really start to, a path that takes us much more to a planned economy and all the economic inefficiencies and outages that that creates. Um, and lastly, on the economics, there's a commitment that the amount of tax would be the same. So these 100 will deliver as much revenue as the thousand that were envisioned in the blueprint. I don't know what the rate is for that, but that's, that's politically interesting. On the broader comment of Pillar A, I think the taxpayer community realizes we're gonna pay more tax, uh, even just on pillar one, let alone the implications of pillar two. We also know we're gonna have more administrative burden. Uh, we're gonna be filing, if you're in scope you know, pillar amount A, you're gonna be filing in places you didn't have presence. And it's gonna be for relatively marginal amounts. Uh, our fact pattern is disclosed in one of our comment pa papers is 99% of our sales are in 72 countries that we have physical presence. The 1% of our sales is spread over the remaining 120 other countries. Uh, and there's very little tax associated with these markets. So it's from my perspective, high administrative costs for relatively low tax being amounts in magnitude being paid to these markets. Uh, we realize that burden exists, 
But the deal was supposed to be in exchange for certainty. And it looks to me like certainty is being left behind. Uh, there's rumors that there's no agreement and why disagreement on what's an, a reasonable arm's length result for Mount B. And that will be very troubling. To illustrate, uh, my company worked with one of the accounting firms and we asked them to do something you normally don't do. We took global databases and merged them so that we could look at the universe from multiple vantage points of different databases, all the publicly traded data for all distributors globally. There's over 10,000 distributors that get to the final screen when you do this. And when you look at the universe, you can, and this, this attempt to put this all together, we've, we've done demonstrations for OECD staff and a number of the steering committee countries. And open invitation, if any other government wants to see the stimulation, we can certainly share it with them. Uh, all the parameters for screening are available and we can tweak them. Ironically, they don't change the result much. Once you get to what is a distributor, so you exclude really high capital assets because that's indicative of a manufacturer or their financials describe it as a manufacturer or they have a very high R&D. Once you do those basic screens, all the other traditional transfer price screens have very little effect on the outcome. And what you discover is the interquartile range globally is slightly below 2% at the bottom end and slightly above 4% at the top end. And uh, it doesn't vary much by industry or by region. And, and yet when I see an audit experience, it's not uncommon for particularly a developing country to say distributors in my country make 8% or they make 12%, or they make 13%, which these numbers don't sound totally unreasonable, except I have to remind everyone that the global Fortune 500, the average profitability system profits globally is 12.5% of sales. Does it make sense that a distributor gets half of the total when they don't create the product, they don't take the capital risk, they don't do the R&D, and they're not managing the global supply chain? I think not. And so the other reason we did this database search was to see, is there a correlation to system profits? A way to get a reality check so that profitability is not just this abstraction, a percentage of sales, but instead we talk about it in proportion to the total. And it turns out there's a high correlation. The distributor returns the same universe I described as a percentage of sales profitability, can be expressed as system profits. And when you look at it that way, the distributors make between about 11% of the system profits to about 18% of the system profits. I would suggest that's a better way to go. That's what our, our consultation papers have suggested because it grounds the discussion in the reality of the whole. Um, I don't like formulary and I don't like destination income tax, but I think the the value of getting this reality check trumps those two concerns. So um, I think there's a reason to look at this project with optimism, particularly pillar one, but I do think it has to be realistic. Uh, we, we will not see political support in most countries for a radical departure from current practice. And so um, I'm optimistic. <laughs> We've. We've invested a lot of energy as a company. We've participated in every consultation and every written submission, and we're trying to be productive. But I'm a little concerned with where we're going here, particularly, and this is a pillar two comment, but I, it's hard for me to see the offer as anything other than trying to get air cover domestically for the administration's proposal for a 21% minimum tax, which by the way, won't be 21%. Two added features of guilty, which non-US practitioners don't focus on, dramatically drive the effector rate above the headline rate. The 20% disallowance of foreign tax credits is a meaningful increase in your effective rate. And it's particularly meaningful when you go from a global average at a low rate to a per country at a high rate. And in addition, we, we allocate domestic expenses against this calculation, in effect, making them non-deductible. 
those two features together in our budget, in our forecasting, will take a 21% guilty rate actually up to a 28% effective foreign tax rate. It would match the domestic rate. And in our case, it would raise our foreign effective rate 10 percentage points from its current 18% global effective rate. That's highly uncompetitive. And there's no scenario I can see where the EU will adopt it. And they won't adopt it because for a supply chain within Europe, the EU members cannot discriminate against each other. And if Ireland as a sovereign can pick 12 and a half, the minimum tax can't go over that. But even if a country chose to go outside the norm and they adopt a 21, they've got the problem that that base erosion power is even more powerful for Ireland. So as a political reality, my best guess is if Ireland holds true to 12 and a half, it's hard for me to see how the EU member countries would likely adopt anything above 12 and a half. And therefore, there's an inherent disconnect between where the U.S. administration wants to go and where the rest of the world will be. Michael? Uh, thank you very much, Tim. That's great. You covered a great deal of ground there. Um, can I just ask a clarification question there? I mean, you made a, a number of different points. I mean, are you, do you, it, it seemed to be, I think you're arguing, you know, essentially against the kind of allocation specifically to the market per se, but, you know, but you're willing to have some tax in the market, you know, if you can demonstrate some profitability there. That, that's a, that was, and, and I think you, you made some comparisons about the profitability in the US as, as opposed to the rest of the world. Is that, is that kind of broadly, is that a fair characterization? No, it's, there's a nuance. I, I, yeah. There's a pragmatism in getting that tax certainty. We're willing to see some piece of residual. I think we're, as a company, going to be in scope either way. Um, one of my comments was, let's not be sector discriminatory. I don't see a, a good policy rationale for excluding sectors, period. You do have to figure out how to measure things differently. Financials mm -hmm. are a very different industry than goods companies. And the, the profitability indicators are different. But if this is about creating global stability, global tax certainty, it seems like most should be in the system to pay for it. It's, it's peculiar that we're gonna pick 100 companies to pay for the stability for everybody else. And that's one way to interpret the administration's proposal. Uh, so I do think there's an allocation within the parameters of what you could justify from an arm's length standard makes sense. So I think large multinationals have scale. That's one of the reasons they're successful and they're large. Is there a reason to allocate a piece of residual income on that basis? I think the argument's yes. But there's also a self-limiting uh, constraint to that rationale. Because if scale were all important, if we should be allocating much more to the destination market, then you'd see companies being dramatically bigger because bigger would always create more scale and therefore more profitability. The reality is in the capital markets, it's the opposite. There's tremendous pressure to break things apart for focus, fitness, speed, and the idea of a, a mega conglomerate that's scale just because it's big. That's not what the capital markets actually support. So I, I think there's a way to justify and square transfer price principles with a modest allocation, but I underline modest. Okay, uh, thanks. Can I can I kind of take that and maybe generalize it a bit and put it back to some other members of the panel? You know, um, so I, I, I mean, I guess the question in my mind is kind of why are we doing this? You know, what is the rationale? And in particular, you know, uh, I think as Akim said, you know, the scope is a crucial question. Which which sectors are we actually thinking about applying this to? And the U.S. proposal seems to be saying, okay, well, let's not limit it by sector at all. Let's, but we're going to limit it by by size in effect. So I guess the question in my mind is, um, is it, what's the, in, in terms of the rationale, are we, are we, you know, is the 12B limited to digital services because there's a problem with digital services? Uh, is, the, is the pillar one limited to digital services and, and consumer faces being businesses because that's a particular issue there? 
or are, are we limiting it to those sectors because it seems pretty hard to uh, apply it in other sectors? So that was, um, Akin, would you like, could you give us a, a view on that maybe? I can certainly unmute, which is a start. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this is an interesting question and a question where we can spend almost a panel. And it's, it's one of the key questions, because when you think about it, I think starting from the proposition that everybody, maybe not everybody, but a large number of people agree that there is a nexus challenge in the digital age. And so, so we have circumstances in which I think we broadly agree. While there may be questions academically, whether all of this should be on consumption taxes, but if, if, you're, if you get beyond that and you say, no, no, I also see this in the corporate income tax base where there can be a taxing right in particular circumstances in a digital age in the market. And most people, if we had a vote, I don't know, but, but broadly would, would sort of be in that camp. And I think also Richard helpfully indicated that that is true across all of these different approaches. So you also see it in these different approaches. They're not different. I think if you accept that, and I think you must also accept um, that then we need different transfer pricing rules or profit allocation rules, because, you know, if we were in the traditional space, risk assets functions, if there isn't a PE, then this doesn't sort of work. So logically, from a new nexus followed new profit allocation rules. And I think that that's something we see. And then, then there's sort of the question, um, now, how wide does this go? And certainly, you know, that's a journey. People started on the DSTs very narrow, then DSTs started to broaden out. Um, and I think also picking up on what Tim says, you know, these challenges, whether it's pearls or you know, some other challenges, you know, automatic digital services, how automated does it have to be? And what's the level of automation? And, you know, some other forms, you know, if you look at the DSTs, if you take title to the inventory, you get a different result as opposed to not taking title to the inventory. So how much title do the inventory do you have to take? And does it make sense to have, you know, a marketplace operation dealt differently? So you see these challenges. So I think then, you know, where you get to, if you, if you try to sort of go wider and you've seen that in our journey, there was a journey on consumer facing, there was a marketing intangible idea. I think there was a recognition that, you know, trying to sort of limit this to a number of, you know, de facto largely US company raises trade tension, raises questions that go beyond the tech space. Um, so then if you say we, we do go here, I mean, I can see the logic of then saying, well, you know, if, if you looked at our ADS model, which largely I think, you know, the 12B sort of took, I mean, it's essentially very similar to the scope and it sort of copied it over. So good, good, good cooperation here, at least, you know, on this, how stable is that in the future? Do you have to renegotiate that? So I think some of these reflections, you know, if we've heard it from Tim, it certainly drove also the US reflection. Do you actually have a future proof solution? Um, and then how future-proof is the solution? Certainly, if you go for size and profitability, these are functionalities of a system, you know, that, that is stable, that is true. It's probably also true that, you know, in the future, and especially if you put extractives to one side, that many of those that will achieve high profitability will be likely those that leverage intangible property. Uh, you know, if you look at this, and if you look at who would likely be covered, it's those. Now, creating sometimes an artificial subset of intellectual property that we call digital and we treat it differently from other uses of intellectual property, is that right? And is that a sensible distinction? So I think, you know, to give you a long answer, I think we've probably been on a journey. You know, the US has now made a proposal where that journey goes. There's still some questions, you know, is this a proposal that works? But I can see sort of an evolution from a narrow thinking of digital you know, early on us saying you can't ring fence the digital economy, every business essentially saying we're all going digital to something that says, well, what are the other intangible properties, including thoughts around marketing intangible and sort of coming maybe a next step and saying, well, then at the end of the day, do you look at the outcome and the outcome of the use of intangible property, especially when you put extractors to the side, a question on finance, you know, no time for that. You know, that, that, that maybe gets you uh, those companies in scope where you think the justification is there and is that a better way in rather than trying to describe and re-describe and renegotiate business models. Okay, thanks. I mean, I, 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 I'm not really on this panel, I'm asking the questions, but I guess I would also add, you know, from an economist's perspective, there's a, there's a kind of rationale here in that, you know, why is it that uh, you know, individual countries are doing this unilaterally? And you know, part of my answer is well, because they can, um, because there's something there which is not going to move away, and so they can, you know, and that kind of raises questions like, okay, well, how does that fit in with the rest of the tax system? I don't, know, Michael, are you are you on kind of roughly on the same page as Akim here? 
Yeah, well, what I would say, I just want to make two comments. Firstly, 12B is very pragmatic. It's driven by what these developing country pe people saw as their biggest risk. They didn't, for example, talk about users because they thought that they could deal with the worst issues by or, or the, the biggest issues as they saw them, the most immediate issues, by looking at the payments. And, um, and also there's a time element. They needed to get something quickly to get, to get in the UN model. And, and we shouldn't forget that, that time element. But I just wanted to quickly mention on multilateralism that, that everyone agrees in principle multilateral is the best solution. We certainly do in the UN. But then you have to look at the type of multilateral and, and analyze whether it's, it's, you know, it's good, particularly for developing countries in our view, and, and they will judge that. And to get a wider consensus, you often have to narrow the scope of what you're seeking consensus on. And that has an issue that, you know, the photographers know the term of negative space. The positive space is what you're agreeing. But if, for example, if you cover 100 top companies and if you give a, a new dispute settlement regime for them, you know, what's the negative space? How does that affect other companies? What's the interaction with MFN clauses in in bilateral investment treaties, or will other companies be able to claim the, the same um, treatment? And, and even more centrally, by having so-called new taxing right, which I disagree with that term, for a certain number of companies, again, that's the positive space. But is the negative space that for most companies you're reaffirming a rule which is basically out of date, the PE rule? So, you know, I, I want people to think not just about the positive space, but about the flow on impact of the negative space around the, the uh, defined uh, uh, outcomes. You know, what does it mean? Does it hold us back on improving the PE definition in other areas going forward? Um, so are we linking ourselves too much to the past, even when in certain respects going to the future? And that's not just a comment on the OECD. That's something we have to look at in, in our work as well. So that's my sort of broad comment on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Michael. So I'm, I, there's a number of questions on the q and I have a number of questions that are both technical and, you know, I kind of broader like, like this. Maybe, maybe I could just pose one of the broader questions before we get into the slightly more technical ones, although time is already running out. And that's, that's um, it's really a question, of, I, I think Tim mentioned it, but something like, you know, an excess profits tax. Could we not, I mean, there's, there's, why do we need to give any relief at all? And this comes back to the kind of DSP versus the 12B proposal in a sense. Why don't we kind of take this uh, new tax at the, at the market level, which is a kind of small piece of residual profit. Do we really need to worry about double taxation there? Or can we just say, well, this could be a way of, you know, I take Tim's point, if funding the pandemic, I, I take Tim's point that, you know, the pandemic isn't gonna be always with us, but we'll probably be paying it off for quite a long time yet. Um, would that be a sensible way forward? Anybody on the panel like to either agree with me or strongly disagree with me? It would be simpler, wouldn't it? Well, so is a gross receipts tax. <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, but, in, but in, in terms of amount A, this is a kind of small part of residual profit. It, it is, you know, essentially a part of excess profit. Well, let's see if it's small first, if it's, only left 100, it may not be small. But I think relief of double tax is a fundamental principle. I mean, uh, it's a trade barrier not to. It, it, if this only applies to 100 and they incrementally have double taxation on the same income, that's, that is discriminatory. And at what level is that tolerable? I, you know, we have it in today with MAP when sometimes they're unagreed. But these are intended to be rare. We're, it's different when you design it intentionally to do this. So I would suggest we should try to figure out following the supply chain in principles. You know, if you want to deal with the surrendering, it's actually quite simple if you do a couple things. If you do a multi-year average and it's a trailing average, it means that when you calculate your targeted distributor return, day one of a calendar year, you actually know the target for the full year. And therefore you could effective it, you could effectively push it through regular transfer price principles the way you do now. And it would just, it would end up where the residual income is. That's 
how the process currently works, you wouldn't have to have any special new rules. Okay. I think I need to think more further about that one. Let, let me let me change this topic again about the kind of tax certainty process, which you know seems to, it, you know is good for business. It kind of raises questions of sovereignty. And there's a question in the Q&A from Martin Hearson saying there's strong opposition from emerging markets and lower income countries to some elements of the tax certainty proposals. And he wants to know whether that's been resolved and if so, how. Um, I don't know who could come in on that. Um, Richard, Sophie, Akim, Akim, yeah. Happy to, to give it a go. Um, I, think, I think it's clear and that Tim said this also. I mean, for a number of countries, not naming names, you know, the tax certainty dimension is an incredibly important part. And I think there's two dimensions that we need to keep apart. You know, I will um, just use the term so that uh, Michael can object to using the term of the new taxing rights a little game. <laughs> so for the amount A, let's be neutral. <laughs> and given that Richard invented it, for the amount A, I think there is alignment that this must be a process that is done collectively, that flows from the whole logic of doing it. You know, if we are serious about not creating confusion and a mess where 100 countries would run around and independently audit whether they agree with if we did business line segmentation, whether that's the right business line segmentation, the allocation of unallocated cost, central cost, that is an unworkable system. Um, in that case, you know, like the simpler unilateral measures. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's broadly understood. That raises challenges. I think we have very detailed discussion of how you run this process. And I think we got very good input. You know, I remember the, the American Bar Association and others in terms of how you can design this process. Um, I think also that is not just a sort of a standalone thing in a vacuum where we never work on tax certainty. That's the only place, as some of you know on the panel, there's a big broader tax certainty agenda, which independent and separate from the pillar is a very important agenda. And in some sense, you know, we should not forget there is life beyond the pillars, even if we talk a lot about the pillars, that there is this very important tax certainty dimension of which this is a part. And you can also see it about a journey to better tax certainty, whether it's Action 14, ICAP, tax administration, there's loads of things that we're doing where we're all better off as tax administration of doing this. Um, so I think that broadly is accepted. The challenge I think you have is when you go beyond and you're not in this, what I call the amount A, but you know what Tim's called the amount B or the amount C or whatever you call it, the, the traditional transfer person. And that's a piece where we have to make real progress and where there are differences. I think it's very clear um, that if there is no tax certainty beyond amount A, I don't think there is a deal. Uh, now I might be wrong, but I think that's the clear understanding and that's sort of the working assumption of the secretary. At the same time, as Michael mentions, you know, um, there is significant reservation among some countries. We know this. We don't have time for a fully fledged arbitration debate. So how can we bring this intelligently together? And I think we have a number of developing countries as well as developed countries trying sort of new ideas and new ways, because we're not vetted to the what we call and how we label these concepts as long as we make sure that there is tax certainty at the end. We couldn't have a system whereby you know, there's an amount A that is being allocated through the system and somebody through a creative application of transfer pricing creates loads of little additional amount A's that are being imposed on the same taxpayer. So that, that wouldn't be a stable system. I think we must have, and I think that's the idea here at least that we're saying, well, we accept. And I think Tim would do this too, maybe in a, in a different system with a different November maker that some residual profits go on the market. Um, and so that's the logic also that we see here. But then we also need to be clear. And when those residual profits go to the market, they go to the market once. They don't go to the markets twice or three times or four times. And so I think that that needs to come together. Um, is this something that's easy? No. Um, you know, if, if it was easy, it probably would have been done already. Yeah, Michael. Very quick comment. I, I think the certainty in itself is not a good. I mean, certainty that you're going to be shot at dawn is, is not necessarily a good thing. So we have to say certainty about what? And a lot of developing countries, their experience is certainty that the investment protection provisions in, in their uh, investment agreements will be interpreted by a panel in a very pro-investor way. Uh, and that's just the background. So I think we have to give them confidence that that the certainty is that 
the agreement they've signed will be interpreted in basically in, in, in how they and, and others fairly understood it when they signed it, you know, using Vienna Convention rules and so forth. So that's the key. I think mediation has a role to get them more used to experts coming from outside and giving their, their distinguished opinion. And then they're more likely to be willing for them to make binding decisions over time. But that's the certainty that's needed is the certainty that there will be a fair interpretation of what's actually been agreed. Thank you. And, and if I just jump in, now we're having a bilateral conversation, but I think that's, that's what we're doing. I mean, there is over 130 countries in the inclusive framework. We speak with the small countries in different regions. You will also have seen that, for instance, in the blueprint, we said, well, you know, for some of the smaller developing countries that don't have a map inventory, no issues, can we have some other procedures? So we're trying to see you know, that we have a measured solution that gets us to the tax certainty, but it's something that people can work with. And as you say, Michael, there may be new concepts. At, at the end, it's, it's trying to get to a result. It's not trying to force upon and we're aware of the experiences in other areas and the implications that they have. Okay, uh, thank you, Frame. We are running out of time for this panel, unfortunately, already. Um, there's never enough time to talk about all these issues. We haven't really covered anything to do with revenue sourcing. We haven't really covered anything to do with segmentation. Um, so there are, you know, there are a lot of detailed issues and important issues which we haven't covered. So apologies to everybody for that. Um, there are also important issues for Pillar 2, and we want to leave time for those as well. I, let me just... Can I just finish with a, a, a quick a quick question, you know, and hope for a very very quick answer from each of the panelists on this, which is um, wh where we're we going in the longer term. I think, which is so. I've been thinking about you know the benefits of taxing in the market country for quite a long time, two decades since I first wrote a paper on this. I think it's it's you know it's taken like seventeen years for it to kind of get to the mainstream, where you know there's actually a policy debate about this. And I guess my, the question in the back of my mind is, you know, is this the end of the process? Have we kind of finally got it there? And, you know, whatever we do with Pillar 1 and 12B, that's it? Or is this the starting point? Is this the kind of, the kind of moment at which we actually realise there are some benefits of moving to the market country and, and we're going to go beyond that? So I don't know whether anybody would like to make a prediction. I'm going to pick on somebody just to start off with. Richard, are we, is this the end or the end of the beginning? Uh, according to my research, I count at least 10 reasons that have been given for moving to market-based taxation. So my uh, observation, trying to duck your requirement that I predict the future, uh, is, that the, the, is that there is probably a compelling, probably inexorable uh, push to taxation in the market. So I, I see this um, as certainly ver verging on the inevitable and very likely to be the beginning of a process that goes forward. Okay, thanks. Sophie? I do not have a crystal ball, but I, I do think that it's a, it's a, it may seem in terms of the economic impact assessment that Pillar 1 is small, as Tim mentioned, modest, but I do think that the most innovative approach to Pillar 1 is really to the first time in history, having countries seriously looking at the m and &E group taxation as one unit. And to me, that's a, a big step uh, in, in the international reform and, and one that hopefully will inspire more comprehensive uh, uh, taxation system for m and &E groups. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, who's next? Tim, what do you think? Um, well, I think as I indicated, I think there's definitely room for allocating some residual income. I think going to the extreme where all residual income goes to the destination market, which is the, you know, the logical extension of all these arguments, I think creates strange disincentives for countries. Um, there's a reason why intellectual property right in, in IP, valuable IP, is, is not globally distributed evenly. It has to do with investments, critical mass, university systems, a lot of things. And the societies that created them paid for them. And if their tax base doesn't benefit from the creation, I think over time it's going to produce a lot of trade difficulties that are not pleasant. I mean, the whole reason 
my company has been supporting this initiative from the start is we want stability. We want it pragmatically, even if it costs us some, but uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's important that we do not have the anarchy that the absence of a global agreement implies. Uh, that's a very bad outcome for everyone. It would impede cross-border flows globally and with it, a declining standard of living for almost all. So um, I'm hopeful that there's a way to reach a compromise and that it's balanced and sharing some of the residual I think is logical, uh, but I don't think the extreme extension is politically viable from those that are currently the ones that created the IP. Okay, very clear, thank you. Michael. Yeah, just to be a little bit mischievous, <clears throat> first of all, I don't think you've wasted your time on <laughs> looking at taxation and market. Yeah. Secondly, the um, League of Nations got there early and thirdly, the UN got there quite early. So uh, just a thing a bit mischievous there, but, but Seriously, you know, I do hope that 12B has its influence on multilateral discussions, because I agree, multilateralism is the best way ahead, but it has to be a consensus, and it has to be something that's good for, for you know, all manner of countries, even if they don't think it's the best possible solution. So I think maybe we're at a midpoint, maybe we're at an early point, it's, that will get everyone fatigued. But uh, I, I think I'm really pleased that taxation of the market is, is taken such a hold and I'm glad to see that Rajad Bansal is in the audience, maybe Carlos Prado, two of the authors of, of 12B. So I think it's a, a, a good pragmatic time to be, but we all have to work together and, and seek something that works for all stakeholders, um, administrations as well as uh, taxpayers, because for us, sustainable development depends on all of those working together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In the seconds last, in the drop. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to give you the last word on this panel, but you're also going to get the first word on the next panel. So <laughs> <accurate. laughs> just, just briefly, I think echoing some of these, I think, you know, and, and as the OECD Secretariat, I'm speaking for myself, I also don't have a crystal ball here. I, mean, I think the key, at least for us, is the stabilization of the system. I think that we have reliable rules for the future, that, that, and that requires that people buy into the rules because they need to buy into the rules in this wider community for them to be stable. I also agree um, that speaking, when I look at it, that, that while that probably means some form of taxation in the market, and I haven't seen all the 10 sources that Richard cites, but I also see the incentive structure to retain residence taxation. I think not just as something for now, but also as, as I think Tim explains, that there is something that you need to be able to be entitled to the reward of the types of innovation um, that you're facilitating with the means that you're putting at the disposal of your people. And so I think that's the stability and hopefully, you know, if we're successful, then we, we are coming to a at least medium term stable point. Thank you very much to all the panelists. That's been a, a great discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we didn't have more time to talk about that. Sorry to people who've uh, posed questions and comments on the Q&A, which we haven't had time to answer. Um, some people have asked about this paper that Richard, John Burr and I have written. It's available on the Centre for Business Taxation website. And I will ask Jenny, Jenny, could you just put the, a link to that in the, in the chat so that everybody could see that at, at some point? We're gonna, we're gonna pause now. We, we've been going for just over two hours. We're gonna talk about pillar two next with a new panel. I propose we have a 10 minute break. We're actually running 10 minutes behind the schedule, but um, let's have a 10 minute break anyway. In the UK, it's, it's 10 past four, it's time for afternoon tea, which we always do in the middle of cricket matches. So we always have to have our afternoon tea and cake. We have that now for 10 minutes. We will start again at 20 past the hour, 20 past four in the UK and 20 past whatever time it is where you are. So thank you for staying uh, for so long and we'll start again in 10 minutes and thank you. And we have a great set of panelists, as you can see. Um, so the idea is we're going to start with each panelist uh, making some preliminary uh, comments for five to seven minutes or something around that time. And then we'll follow up with uh, questions, uh, which, uh, you know, I have a list of questions I can ask myself, but uh, I invite everyone to um, write questions in the Q&A and I'll try to do a better job than Mike did in reading all the questions and 
passing them on to the to our panelists. So um, without further ado, let me just introduce the speaker. So uh, the panelists, so the first is Akim Pross, who you've already heard from, but just to remind you, Akim is the head of International Cooperation and Tax Administration Division at the Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD. Uh, Vicky Perry is the Deputy Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF. Mindy Hertzfeld is a professor of tax law at the University of Florida and a prolific writer on tax issues. And Danny McCoy is the CEO of IBEC, which is the Irish Business and Employers Confederation. And amongst many other things, uh, Danny is also a member of the OECD BIAC Working Group on Corporate Taxation. So a great uh, panel, and I'd like to start by asking Akim with his uh, preliminary comment. I mean, I'll be brief. I mean, you've said too much on the first panel. And, and so um, I will assume everybody knows what the pillar does. You've heard, I think, the political context already, I think, from Pascal and, and, and Mike. Um, if I just go somewhere one level down, I think, um, um, and then keep the minimum rate for the end, um, I think, you know, work is progressing. I think it has been progressing um, in relatively high level of detail. We've also gotten good input from civil society and businesses. Um, you've seen the blueprint. The blueprint itself is already quite detailed. So, you know, many of the components, I think on a technical basis, I think I would think are largely stable, um, whether that's the question of scope, whether that's the question of thresholds, whether that's the question of the base, whether that's the question of jurisdictional blending, whether that's the question of you know, the definition of covered taxes. So as you go through the elements, many of these elements are stable. We've gotten a business input, I think in particular on the design of the rule in two areas, somewhat technical on you know, the, the, the fair tax accounting and to what extent that that's relevant. And we're working through that. We have a business advisory group as well that provides input. Um, and of course, on the question of simplifications, and similarly, I think we're trying to work through this so that we wouldn't create a system whereby you have to do a very complicated calculation in order only to then conclude what you already knew, that there isn't an inclusion and how can we have some balancing systems in um, the administrative cost that that might bring. Um, as Pascal has mentioned, and I think as uh, Michael asked, there is a substance carve out and the, the work is quite advanced on the technical question of how this can be done. So if you could decline through the different building blocks, many of them are technically quite advanced and there's ongoing discussions that we had last week that we're gonna have next week in terms of how this moves forward. Similarly, also on the big rule orders of the income inclusion rule, the under tax payment rule, and this ongoing work and how it is, but as components, I think they're also pretty stable, uh, both in their design and also in their understood functionality. Um, um, I think then, you know, if you look at that, uh, that's the globe rule, so to speak. And then I think there's also a recognition that um, if you want to have a consensus, you know, there needs to also be a subject to tax rule as part of an overall package. And there's also good work that is progressing on the design of this rule. Uh, there are open questions. Um, there are open questions on all of these components, but the technical work is quite advanced. And as Pascal, I think also has said, um, it is something that largely um, is based on domestic law. Um, so it is something that, you know, if you think about the U.S. has done in a different version, as we know, with global blending, but it's a piece of domestic legislation. If you go back, in fact, you can read uh, the early versions of this thought process already in Action 3 of the BEPS Action Plan. So at the moment, uh, there is both political discussions um, reaching towards into the summer in terms of trying to get, as, as, as Mike Williams has said, a two-pillar package together and is he has rightly said there's people that are more interested in pillar one and there's people more interested in pillar two. Um, but many of them also take the position of, of Mike that, you know, if I can have one um, and I'm satisfied with this, I will buy the other. And there's different variations of this. And at the same time, I think there is a technical process uh, that we're advancing to be ready also with the technology um, that this coincides then hopefully with the political agreement on the pillar. 
Um, maybe then, you know, just just the last, you know, the, 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 the point that was made about where is the minimum tax rate, the politically most important question, I'm sure it will come at the end, we know where the US process is, we know where some of the others are, um, this will have to be brought together. So this is not the place for me to speculate about where a possible min rate might be. So I'll keep it short, and then happy to answer questions and give it back to you. Thank you very much, um, Akim. Uh, so we can move on to the next um, speaker, who's Vicky. Uh, Vicky. Thanks a lot, John. Um, and before I start, uh, just to say that the views I express are, are my own and don't necessarily represent those of the IMF, its management or executive board. So with that, when Mike and John asked me to participate uh, in this incredibly interesting conference. They asked especially that I talk about developing countries and low-income countries. Uh, and so I'm mostly going to do that. So as many of you will know, a main question is the rule order question, the elephant in the room for the developing countries. Developing countries and their champions, civil society, various tax groups that work with them are much opposed to the notion that um, the uh, income inclusion rule will take precedence over the under tax payments rule, which is basically um, saying that the residence countries will get first crack at whatever the top up is uh, on based on an minimum tax under pillar two. The subject to tax rule, yes, comes in um, and it comes first, but it doesn't entirely fix this um, since it would in many cases require treaty renegotiation. It doesn't apply to all the payments that seem to be important for developing countries. As Pascal said, it's a complement. Um, it's worth noting that a number of low income countries, especially in Africa, already have unilateral variants of under tax, the under tax payments rules. Um, about half of the sub-Saharan African countries belong to the inclusive framework at this point. Query whether those that do belong would have to agree to eliminate or not impose under tax payments rules if pillar two goes forward and is sort of generally agreed with the inclu uh, income inclusion rule taking precedence and will other unjoining countries then join or not? Some countries have said they're holding back on joining in order to avoid signing up to another, to a set of un rules that aren't determined yet. Although as Pascal pointed out this morning, adopting pillar two doesn't require as a logical matter, every single country or jurisdiction to, to join in, in that. Um, and there is, as an aside, I would say, there's an interesting proposal by several people. I referred to civil society and tax organizations that work with developing countries um, that would change the rule order, not by flipping it around, but by a sort of compromise that would cross over residence and source. The IIR rule being, of course, favoring the residence countries the under tax payments rule favoring source countries, their proposal would eliminate the difference, allocate some additional taxing rights to each, um, which they refer to as a minimum effective tax rate proposal, METR. Um, and the interesting aspect of this, aside from compromising so that there's no priority of residence and source, I think is that it basically brings in rather strongly a formula apportionment approach and a unitary tax base. Um, it is rather complex, this proposal to say the least, um, but uh, it's interesting in the removal of the, res of the resident source distinction, I think personally. So how much is directly at stake here for low income countries? The OECD estimate for pillar two, um, was made last October was in a range of something like 1.8 to 3% of their existing corporate income tax revenue, i.e. not very much really, though that's not so different from the percentage of CIT revenue that it's estimated that high income countries would get. Um, obviously the amount is way smaller. 
But the overall longer term impact of pillar two would depend on how the how it's structured. I mean, in theory, the IIR would set a floor under which tax competition, if enough countries joined it, would become fairly fruitless if everybody was behaving rationally. And as Pascal put that, it's a bit of a safety net. So thus, even with the currently proposed rule order, um, low, in our view, and this is me and my colleagues, certainly non-low tax, low income countries should benefit even under the IRR because it reduces the incentives to lower their own tax burdens on investment. This is actually stronger, this effect. On, on the one hand, if uh, Pillar 2 goes on a country by country basis, not a blended, a blended basis, um, and as has already been discussed at some length, the current US guilty is on a blended across countries basis, but the US now does appear to be proposing to go along with a country by country approach. Um, Mike Williams noted, I, I heard him say that it would be very hard to have guilty coexist with pillar two if guilty remained on a blended global basis. But, uh, and again, the US administration proposes to go country by country partly for this reason, although of course that does depend on Congress. But maybe more notably, and, and uh, Keem was just referring to the fact that there's a substance carve out and that's kind of being worked on in the current pillar two. The effect for low income countries of this safety net underneath uh, a level at which it doesn't make sense to, com to compete for lower taxes, the effect is stronger if routine profits are included, not just some measure of excess profits under a substance car vote. Pillar two now has the substance car vote. The current US guilty has a form of substance car vote since it is supposedly only applicable to profits in excess of a fairly high return on tangible assets abroad. Um, if you put in such a substance car vote, one way of thinking about it is that it focuses the proposal more on combating profit shifting, like mobile economic rents versus just flat out tax competition itself. That is stopping the cutting of the overall effective tax rates on corporate investment. Obviously both do both, but the balance is shifted a bit. Um, the Biden proposal would drop the aspect of taxing only the excess returns and go for a very strong minimum tax approach certainly at 21%, that would be very strong. Um, the Tax Policy Center calculated that if a 21% rate, minimum rate were adopted in the US and um, guilty still was basically imposed at, or if a 28% general rate were adopted and instead of going with 21%, the current guilty proposal their current guilty law stayed in effect so that the guilty effective rate would be half of the overall rate that would that would bring the guilty rate to about 14%, which is probably a lot closer to what's being discussed um, in the inclusive framework. Um, but I don't know. Um, but in any event, that um, that without a substance carve out they cal calculate would increase the effective rate on foreign investment profits of US multinationals by four percentage points. Um, if the carve out for routine returns that exists now and guilty were retained, it would be uh, not four, but about two and a half. So there is a significant difference in the impact um, of carving out a of a substance carve out versus not having one. Um, Pascal, if I heard him right this morning, said that some carve out would be needed, research and development he mentioned, but that the proposal was attempting to move away from the harmful versus non-harmful tax competition approach. So query where we'll wind up with that. Maybe the most important thing to say about this from a low income country point of view or, or observation is that many low-income countries don't want to minimize their ability to offer effective investment incentives um, or what they view as in fact effective investment incentives. So there's a tension between applying the minimum tax to all profits, which would make that 
the effect of such investment incentives lower versus just applying it to economic rents and excess profits. From the point of view of maximizing their revenue, they should be for the former, but from the point of view of offering effective investment incentives, they should really be, if anything, for the latter. So there is a tension here. And finally, I'll just wrap up this, and again, happy to answer questions, but finally, I'll just wrap up by saying, can low capacity countries really administer pillar two? This has been touched on already um, today, but this would come into play, especially if one, when the under tax payments rule applies, which in the current proposal would only be very much of a backstop. Um, as Pascal pointed out, it would be a bigger backstop depending on how many major capital exporters actually adopt the inclusive the uh, income inclusion rule. But in fact, a major rationale that was, given, that was given for leading with the income inclusion rule is that it makes compliance and administration much easier than the under tax payments rule. Many of the low income countries suspect that the other reason is that it gives the tax to the residents country. But I think there is definitely some truth, to the, a lot of truth to the fact that it would be much harder for every country that would be applying the under tax payments rule to do that than to have the headquarters country figuring out the in, uh, income inclusion rule. How would low income country administrations figure out what the effective tax rate is and in partner investing countries, which many will be intermediate jurisdictions or going through intermediate jurisdictions. So that I think is uh, a question to be continued. Um, and I'll stop there. And with those observations and happy to, when we get to the question round. Thank you very much, Vicky. I'm, I'm really tempted on to open this up to discuss some of these questions, but I, I think I'd better resist that and uh, wait for Mindy and Danny's contributions before we, we start discussing all these important issues. So, um, and I'm, I'm, we'll go next to Mindy. So Mindy, I'm very jealous of your background, uh, but please, can you start with, you know, my, my weather app says it's cloudy, so I thought I'd be okay, and then... Who, I was hoping I would no. make a fool of myself and that you'd have a virtual background there, but I, I think that it is weird, but yeah. Um, uh, so, so I was asked to, to talk about my views on uh, minimum taxes and also U.S. views on, on Pillar 2, um, neither of which I, I have a good... Uh, uh, really comprehensive uh, things to say about, but so... Uh, thing of views on pillar uh, on min taxes. Uh, fortunately, Pascal gave me some thoughts because he I, I thought, what are the goals of uh, min taxes? And, and Pascal kind of listed them as uh, well revenue raising, as he said, what who's going to pay for for COVID, uh, putting an end to the race to the bottom for uh, for corporate taxes, which uh, Secretary Yellen has also mentioned uh, numerous times. Uh, tax peace, uh, stability, certainty. Okay, so that, those are Pascal's uh, kind of goals for, for min taxes. And I, I heard uh, Mike Williams say, well, I don't really care about min taxes, but I'll, I'll take them if I, if I can get the reallocation that comes with pillar one. So, so that's another perspective. And uh, Vicky would say, uh, uh, well, the importance of min taxes is to, to cut back on uh, tax competition important for, for developing countries particularly. So uh, kind of similar to the race to the bottom, but with an additional element of, of really uh, stopping competition more broadly, I think. And then uh, look at you know, what the US was trying to achieve both when, when it enacted uh, guilty to begin with and, uh, and it, the current proposals. So why, why did the US enact uh, what uh, can, may or may not be called a minimum tax. Well, it was seen as a backstop to the U.S. going to a territorial system that there would be a need for additional rules to prevent against base erosion. And uh, as probably most of the listeners know, the U.S. territorial system is one really in name only. Uh, and the uh, minimum tax aspect of uh, guilty is, is kind of taken over the territorial. And then we've got current administration proposals that um, say, well, that guilty encourages offshoring. And so we've gotten tight, we have to tighten it in order to, uh, to make it more effective. And so, so I, I 
question those goals. But anyway, I think we can see here just four different perspectives. And this is not, you know, there's 134, 136 other members of the uh, inclusive framework who, who would have their own views uh, on, on what we're trying to accomplish with minimum taxes. But one thing that I never really hear of is talk about like, so those are all the great things that minimum taxes could accomplish. Nobody seems to be talking about the costs of a minimum tax um, and, and the downsides. And that, that, that's just really absent. And so I think we shouldn't be fooling ourselves to think we could broadly enact more taxes and not change taxpayer behavior. And so if what we're trying to do is impose more taxes on foreign earnings of uh, resident companies, uh, headquarters, jurisdictions, um, we have to, assist. so we've, we're making foreign investment, we're making outbound investment more expensive, necessarily, we're taxing it more. And so we have to assume that a uh, corollary will be less outbound investment. And so maybe we think that's a, a okay trade-off for collecting more revenue, but we should at least have an open and honest conversation about the likely consequences of imposing uh, higher taxes on foreign earnings of headquartered companies. Uh, so, so that's the um, that's the first part. Uh, those are my views on minimum taxes. Now, to go to the uh, U.S. perspective on pillar two, I think you've heard some of that from from Pascal and and from. Uh, Tim and, and Mike, but but I think um, so. So obviously, the U.S. is broadly supportive of adopt adoption of a minimum tax, right? They, that the U.S. went ahead and did it, so nothing to lose if the rest of the world adopts it. But but I think there's a big gap between a, being in favor of a minimum tax broadly and the details, uh, and there are big differences uh, between the. OECD proposals still and, and current US law. And even if administration proposals would bring, would, would narrow those differences, they're, they're, um, it's not clear that, that Congress would enact those uh, changes at all. And I think Vicky alluded to uh, Mike's comments uh, about how uh, it wouldn't necessarily be okay if the US uh, guilty was was significantly different than than what the OECD proposed so so I don't know how you bridge that uh, but then it a couple of people have alluded to kind of uh, the importance of uh, that Congress uh, that, that what the administration proposes is, is not the end of the story in the United States that Congress does weigh in here uh, uh, under U.S. separation of powers principles. And so, so I'm going to kind of paraphrase comments made by a congressional staffer a couple of months ago when, when asked about how Congress would view, and this goes for both Pillar 2 and Pillar 1, you know, a three-pronged analysis. The first question being the revenue impact. Uh, will the proposal raise revenue for the United States? Uh, the second point being, what will the United States gain from the proposal? And the third point being, is the pain of the agreement worth the gain? And so if we look at each of those questions, uh, revenue impact, will the proposal raise funds in the US? And so this goes for, for the administration's proposed changes. Well, obviously you would think that raising the rate on the foreign earnings would raise revenue, but because of some of the complexities that Tim alluded to and how the foreign tax credit is calculated for guilty, I think it, it's less clear. Uh, and other aspects of the OECD proposal, if they were rolled into the US uh, system, could mean less revenue for, for the United States. The US system now doesn't allow for any carryover of losses or carryover of credit and the OECD proposal does. 
So, so that's a big question mark. Uh, the second big question mark is uh, what would the U.S. gain from these proposals? And there, here you shouldn't expect U.S. lawmakers, members of Congress, to support any measure unless it's viewed as helping the country and their own constituents. Uh, so any agreement that's reached in order for Congress to support it would have to demonstrate uh, positive benefits for the U.S. economy, uh, U.S. jobs, U.S. trade. I, I don't think there's any been any demonstration of that uh, yet. And then the third point is the pain worth the gain. Uh, the complexity of the current proposals is is still significant, even though, as Akim has said, uh, working to to try and simplify that. But uh, on this point, perhaps reforming uh, guilty could have some benefits. So, so um, I, I think uh, Cong Congress uh, enacted uh, BEPS related changes when it viewed it as uh, give, as a positive benefit overall. That you, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, enacted. Uh, anti-hybrid rules and an interest expense limitation, but it's viewed like, like it should be in every country is from its own domestic lens. And, and so it's unclear right now uh, where any of these changes would stand. Thank you very much, um, Mindy. And uh, we'll move on to, uh, so again, you raised a number of issues which I'd like to uh, discuss with the rest of the panel, uh, but before that, uh, we have our final panelists, so thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Danny, thank you for joining us. Um, would you share your views, please? Yeah, thanks very much, John. And um, uh, I'm Danny McCoy. I'm the um, CEO of, of um, IBEC, which is the business representative organization. So slightly outside of the, the tax specialism. Um, so when, when Mike asked me, I wasn't sure to use the parlance of of the year, whether we're a variant of interest or a variant of concern um, in, uh, in the Irish case, but it's certainly been a um, really interesting period uh, through BEPS to see the transformation of what is a very small uh, cog in the uh, economic sphere to see a society that could be so transformed um, by an international um, effort to try to tackle the intangible economy that's developed. So much maligned, much discussed, the Irish economy has grown by more than 100% in the last six years uh, on the back of the BEPS process. Um, and so that kind of Midas aspect has many consequences for society as well, is that the, the level of corporate taxation in terms of a global context isn't particularly significant uh, to the societies that are losing them, but to the society that receives them, uh, it's a really strong uh, crowding out effect potentially when a society can't absorb it. But to that's more the societal point. I think um, when we get to this conversation, um, and I think Mindy really caught it really well, what are some of the factors here that when you, when you get very narrowly into the taxation element, um, are there other variables? You know, I don't follow the econometrics of the taxation debate enough, but is there, is there multicollinearity here? Are we talking about the legal systems that exist? Because one of the key features that never really seems to me get discussed in the, in the popular structure is why was it in the first phases of BEPS that the two, inter the two uh, countries of significance um, in this trend seem to have been Britain United Kingdom and Ireland? Like, was it that factor of the uh, common law legal system and its a capacity to, to interpret novelty in terms of corporate holdings or principal establishments separate to the uh, taxation debate? You know, interestingly, uh, given that, again, to kind of draw on the COVID story, one of the inversions of 2014 was when Pfizer and AstraZeneca nearly got together um in uh, uh driven by the beps process and uh, the inversion debate uh, is there more complexity here than the narrowness of the tax code tax debate in trying to layer on what what fundamentally we're dealing with here is that real big economic shift from tangible driven balance sheets to intangible 
and the type of increasing returns to scale that result from a kind of winner takes all. And they generally are in corporates, but is there a sense in which now the concern here as opposed to interest um, element is that particular countries um, have that increasing returns to scale aspect as well. Um, what, you know, what was the pillar two in specifically uh, bring about here? Well, let me make just a distinction between what might be the Irish government's position and business interests here. And maybe to, to talk about uh, the European uh, process from before, which is kind of lurking the consolidated corporation tax base, we'd have some interest in this, is that businesses still want the certainty and still want the allure of the simplicity um, that could be brought about by both pillar one and pillar two, going back to Mike's um, uh, earlier comment in, in, in the first phase, is that the governments obviously in a triple CTB world would want the revenue, but that always fell down on a bit of a pillar one, is how do you share that out? Um, and what is the, you know, what was the advantage of that? Well, businesses said, well, more administrative ease uh, would be one of the features of a triple CTB. What's the administrative ease kind of going back to what Mindy, I think was hinting at there on these proposals, because for business, it just sounds like legislators trying to do the one arm bandit piece to raise their revenues, but where will the expenditures come and will these underpin or undermine the business model or in turn for small countries, the actual country and society. And so the, the Irish government's position um, is aligned in the, with business in the saying that yes, multilateralism is the way to go here and whatever is decided will be the way the rules will be played. But what is the disadvantage or what are the costs of a minimum um, tax rate? Well, prima facie, it would tend to suggest that on competitive forces, uh, taxation isn't operative anymore. And so we turn towards those more expenditure items that larger countries may have advantages on, be they their uh, university systems or technology innovation or aspects around um, state aid rules dressed up in various ways. So I think that the the prism that Ireland being uh, a society of interest or, or concern will be on the pillar two about the capacity for small open economies to actually ensure that part of their arsenal is the capacity to have sovereignty over their taxation. Um, if the minimum tax rate in the Irish context is higher than the 12.5%, does that mean that that's no longer operative for business? That would be of concern, but once it's known and stable, um, I think people will get on with it. Um, so the probably real frustration coming from the business community and, and Ireland being a globalized hub get to uh, reflects quite a lot of those international business of, of interest here is that this process actually is li as likely to bring more uncertainty than certainty in a time frame to when their actual business models may or may not exist in, in a few years with, with other competing pressures. So it's probably a hope that this summer will bring about that type of multilateral certainty. Um, and I think that's something that business could live with and governments could live with in the Irish context as well. But probably what will be more concerning is that it doesn't bring certainty and we don't get closure because one thing we're, we're sure of is that those types of businesses that are currently in vogue today may or may not uh, be around in uh, a short time period or certainly not in the business model that they have at the moment, which again goes, to my final point goes back to that flexibility, which is interpretive flexibility, which may be nothing got to do with the taxation system, but everything got to do with the legal system. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Danny. So, um, Loads of issues to discuss, and um, I, I'd like to start with, with two quick points, maybe one which is just a clarification point uh, for Akim, if I may, Akim. Um, so it, it relates to a point which um, Pascal made and which uh, Vicky mentioned, uh, which is the substance-based carve-out, because you know whether or not a pillar two type proposal has a substance-based carve-out makes a difference to the, in a way, 
the goals of the of the proposal, it, uh, uh, minimum global minimum tax with a substance based carve out is quite different from global minimum tax without a substance based carve out, of course. And um, I mean, we know that countries have very strong views on this. And uh, but in the blueprint, we did have a substance based carve out. And uh, now the US seems to be in favor of a global minimum tax without a substance based carve out. Um, I heard if I heard Pascal well, it seemed to imply that there, you're working with the assumption that there will be a substance-based carve-out. I just, you know, I was, I had assumed that there would be some push from the U.S. to try to move away from that. And I, I'm not sure if you can give us a, an answer on this, but is is the view that there will be some kind of substance-based carve-out, or is there a push against that at the moment? I think the, the one thing it's um, we are the servants of the members that sit around. We can propose, they decide. How they decide, I can't tell you. Um, now, you know, in picking up maybe you know some of the the commentary that I think quite usefully illustrated some of the challenges that sometimes countries within their own country find that one part of the government sees a benefit of having no substance carve out, and another part of the government sees a benefit in having a substance carve out. And so some of the countries are actually torn, you know, sort of different fractions, even within a country take slightly different positions. And sometimes the finance minister here, but the minister of economy is somewhere else. And so that's, that's a challenge. Um, I think you also have different experiences. You know, if you stay in the developing countries, a term that I don't really want to use because increasingly we don't quite know what that denotes. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, some, some developing countries, or at least some people feel that they've had positive benefits with certain incentives, other fields that they, they've basically just given up revenue and it's a, it's a, it's a race to the bottom. Um, so um, is there, if you look at the white membership, um, um, a significant interest amongst some to retain a substance carve out? Absolutely. Is there a push by some and has there been to either minimize that, reduce it or eliminate it completely as well? Um, the momentum that now comes in with the U.S. proposal, we need to see how that's absorbed. But if I observe, you know, it, it, it is something that is relevant for a number of countries. Um, and, you know, there's also, you know, implications. This is also a negotiation, ultimately, you know, where's the rate? What does that do to a carve out? And there's, there's different trade offs that, that you can see. So I think some of these discussions, to be frank, may be less influenced by the intellectual purity that one approach is a very different approach from another one, which academically I would subscribe, but also to the realities of all the other drivers that are in this relatively difficult you know, policy mix where different interests come together. And I think Vicky illustrated it quite nicely, even in some of the smaller countries, but equally also in some of the bigger countries. Thanks, thank, thank you very much for that, um, Akim. Um, now, there are a bunch of technical uh, issues which, which I'd like to come to, which were raised in, in the panelists' interventions. But before we go there, I mean, I'd like to go back to something which Pascal uh, um, mentioned. And again, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's again, it's not something where one can have a very scientific view on, but uh, it's an interesting one. And it's a very critical one, which is the question of critical mass. So Pascal spoke about the need for there to be a critical mass of countries for this to work. Um, and I just thought we could have a quick discussion about what we think that critical mass is. Would it be, do we think that the US and the EU would constitute a significant, uh, sufficient critical mass? Uh, you know, do you need more countries than that? Uh, how many more, um, you know, would the, if one country of a significant size say, I don't know, China not play along, would that make a difference at all? Um, do we have uh, any views on this? Well, I could, is that addressed generally to all of us, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's, I guess I was alluding to, I'm not sure what the critical mass is, but it does seem to me, intuitively at least, that it must be quite different for the IIR than for the under tax payments rule. That That is, the under tax payments rule really is something that countries can do unilaterally and they have been doing it. And maybe they just get away with it because most of the ones that, other than the US, <laughs> the elephant in the room, the US beat, which is a kind of under tax payments rule, 
um, you know, most of the countries that have this are small or, you know, a lot of low income countries do have such a rule, but I'm not sure anybody pays all that much attention because it's just not very much money in the grand scheme of things. It is for them. Um, so I guess I think they're different, but Akim may have a much better sense and probably does than I do about, and Danny too, about what do you need for the in income inclusion rule to sort of make this work? If only one country does it, then you're going to have all sorts of inversion problems, presumably. Um, that's why the US guilty provision was accompanied by all of these sort of exit rules and inversion, anti-inversion rules again. So anyway, I guess that, that's just an observation. I don't know the answer. Would anyone else like to come in? Um, Akeem, Danny, Akeem, yeah. I mean, I, I can come in. I mean, you know, the, we're going for a consensus here. So, you know, sort of that's the objective. And, and I think also to be clear, I mean, some of the ones that are strong proponents of this pillar um, and, you know, you can have the costs and I really recognize this what Danny is saying and Mindy, but, but you know, sort of if, if you look at it, I think they, they are convinced that, you know, sort of doing this collectively uh, in terms of the race to the bottom, you know, some of this can stop certain forms of tax competition that they don't see attractive. Now, what does it have to do with bets and where does the substance carve out? I, I part this for a moment. And I think it is probably also true, and that's also what we did in the impact assessment, and that's a bit where the rule order sometimes, I think is exaggerated if you do some dynamic impact assessment. You know, typically businesses won't stay still, and so the money that's currently here, it's not necessarily still there when the rules are in. Businesses might reorganize and might have different transactions. And so it's, it's very difficult. So we shouldn't assume that rule order determines who gets the money. Countries will react, businesses will react in different ways. And so many of the proponents in some sense want to have that, that, that base level um, um, as part of this idea with a carve out, no carve out in this discussion we've had. Um, right. Now, if you wanted to do that, um, you know, how many would you need, which is then not sort of what we're trying to do because we're trying to get everybody on board, you know, countries could do this differently, in which case we also risk that we have all completely uncoordinated features, right? Um, how many would you need that? Well, certainly you would need a significant number of the large residence jurisdiction, as Vicky has invited me to speak about the income inclusion, right? You know, and, and, and then you would also need to think, I guess, you know, what's the inversion risk and, and how much and what, what are some of these countries? So where that exactly ends, I don't know. Um, but that's maybe as far as I would venture. Thank you very much. Yeah, Can I ask a, a question on this? <laughs> I, I heard Pascal say that, well, it doesn't really matter if uh, Caribbean islands adopt the, this because, you know, there's no big companies headquartered in their jurisdictions anyway. And that, doesn't that ignore the fact that many Chinese country companies are actually headquartered in Cayman? And, and so how would you deal with that aspect of, of a large country uh, Maybe supposedly adopting, but but with a lot of its headquartered com companies uh, really being headquartered elsewhere. I mean, it's, it's, I, now the panel is asking questions to the panel, but if that's okay, I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you if you feel you can answer it, I can. Um, I mean, the, the idea is that you have a backstop, and the backstop is the under tax payment rule. You know, that there's variations of the under tax payment rule, and so you know that that that's the idea. In some sense, it's also a system like the hybrids rules. If you wanted to go back, where you know, if I don't, then you shall, and I will step back if you do. You have to make sure that not everybody applies everything at the same time, and that's why we need rule coordination. But that, I think is the basic idea, which is why I don't think we will see an income inclusion rule without some form of an under tax payment rule by those um, that bring forward the income inclusion rule. Okay, Th thanks Akeem. Um, I mean, so can we go back a number, um, Vicky mentioned the, the issue of administrab administrative administrability of the proposal. And, um, and Danny mentioned, uh, Mindy mentioned the costs of the minimum tax and Danny mentioned again, uh, uncertainty and administrability. 
I mean, and I know that uh, Akeem mentioned that there's work being done on simplification here. I mean, do we think that this is, uh, how important is this issue? The, the, you know, trying to get my head around the under tax payment rule was quite challenging. It, it really, it was, you know, I expected it to be an easier, you know, when you think about it, it's, you know, say, okay, we can create this backstop. And then you start reading it and say, wow, this is complex. I mean, do we think this is a, a real issue? Is it, you know, tax law tends to be complex, you know, get used to it, that's the way. The, the, our system works. I mean, is this something we should be genuinely worried about? Can we do anything to uh, simplify matters um, significantly? Anyone? Akeem, yeah. I mean, in some sense, it's probably a question to me. I think A, yes, it is important. And B, I think we can do things. And, you know, I, I think also, you know, part of the reason that the rule order tends to suggest that the income inclusion rule, you know, comes first. I know that some civil societies have other ideas. We've also spoken with them. But it is a simpler way. It, it is. Um, um, you know, there's other things I think that we're looking at, you know, companies already file CBC, can we work off some safe harbors of CBC and we have different explorations given that that's already somebody that's been done that already generates a certain level of compliance cost, can we leverage off that? You know, it's that. We have some tax administration guidance where it's very clear ex ante that you know, if you were to compute the ETR for that jurisdiction, in 99% of cases, it's, it's gonna be above the min rate. Do I force you to go through this calculation every year and can we dispense with that in terms of safe harbors? There's, there's many of these things that we can do. Um, the under tax payment rule is the more complicated rule. Also, it has more coordination with more countries, more risks of double taxation with you know, information not available as easily available as it would be to the tax administration of the headquarters. So it does, one needs to see these challenges and not design a rule in the abstract and not think about the administrative implications. At the same time, from uh, what we were trying to do from the business's perspective, that all the features, all the blocks, all the design elements inside for the company are the same. And so there's a bit of a yin and yang because the under tax payment rule is derived of exactly the same building blocks, the same determination of profit, the same base, the same cover taxes. So you end up with the same result. It's, it's that, that you take the money, it goes one way. Um, so, so we're trying to do it simpler, but it is the more complicated rule. So I guess the message is, a, a min tax is not an easy creature, but there's many things that I think we can do. Um, and of course, there's also reflections in several countries that, you know, when you have a solid min tax, may there then be other rules that you currently have that you no longer lead. In some sense, you can think about almost sort of, sometimes sort of decluttering the system. If it is a solid base of a min tax, maybe that's a more structural solution to some of the hodgepodge that you might have in different pockets of anti-avoidance area. And maybe you, you can actually get rid of those when you bring that in and you feel that that's a solid approach. Yeah, no, that, that is part of the um, benefit, which, which we don't, maybe don't take enough account. Maybe the, the, the pressure on anti other anti-avoidance rules uh, diminishes. So that could uh, be a, reduce some of the administrative uh, costs that we currently have. I don't know, Vicky, Danny or Mindy, did you have anything else to say on administration, simplicity? I, I think, John, maybe it's, it's, it's not been a tax specialist here, but it just feels um, like an economist here that we're dealing in the theory of the second best, but people are coming with rules, first best world kind of rules, even though the topology, the hill walking and where you're maximizing, the topology has changed very dramatically. And then when people start to feel this topology is not what they saw, they say, well, there's where the hump is. Let's go and take the top 100 companies or the tax havens or whatever you might describe it. And there's kind of an abandoned of, of the rules, actually. You know, the rules suddenly become too complex and people are after a win. And that's, you know, that's a non-tax specialist view. The world at the moment is people set off saying, we're going to map this out we're going to bring a first best solution but then they find it's got complex i think the complexity is coming from the intangibility becoming so dominant corporately in such a short space of time that you know even the accountancy rules for dealing with balance sheet uh, apportionment of uh, intellectual property in terms of purchasing it in or growing it organically means that it's just a second best world 
and I see the political imperative for it, but it just feels like these rules are, you know, trying to hang a door when you know that the floor is actually sloped. It's, you get it right on the hinges, it's going to look good, but there's going to be a really big gap in the bottom. And and uh, Vicky, going back to your comment, I mean, the the you can see that some countries are, uh, in, you know, are are more keen on the under tax payment rule than the IIR. But that is a pretty complex rule. I mean, do we have any concerns on their ability to administer a rule of uh, such complexity? Uh, yes, we do. Um, I think, and also to be honest, I think some of the under tax payments rules that are out there in these countries that already exist are not trying to calculate an effective rate in the in the payee country. They're just imposing extra withholding, which obviously you can't do it that way if you have a treaty that prohibits it, but denying deductions, um, imposing extra withholding if there's no treaty. Um, that's not so difficult. Um, but trying to figure out the effective tax rate or the relevant effective tax rate to decide whether you have an under tax payment is, um, is very difficult. I think I agree with what's being said. Uh, I mean, I think there may need to be some sort of simplification for really low capacity countries who are the ones that want the under tax payments rule more. Um, but I guess we'll have to see how that transpires. I think it's something that we and our partners, including the OECD and like the platform for collaboration on tax, once this the ground settles here, one of the things that we very much feel the need to turn to is, okay, so how are we going to help the low capacity countries deal with all of this stuff? Um, yeah. Okay, there are... Um... I mean, unless Mindy had anything to add on this. Um, I'll, I'll just say that it, yeah. it's often business that raises the hand and says, oh, these rules are so complex, you've got to simplify it. But, but there's, it, it's often, it, more complex rules often tend to benefit business because they have more resources and to Vicky's point about low capacity. Uh, and, and so that dynamic is, is not, it's you know, overlooked often. Okay, so there are, um, we have a few minutes left and there are um, a couple of questions I'd like to take uh, from the audience. So uh, the first is from Conrad Kassartorejani and I'll put it to all the panelists and to who would like to pick this up. It says, could a tax barring type system which recognizes the legitimate need for certain countries to use tax incentives as a means to counter jurisdiction specific disadvantages play a role in the context of a minimum tax? Vicky, yeah. Well, I think in a sense, it isn't really called tax sparing and it doesn't necessarily depend on treaties, but this whole idea of a substance carve out is really aimed at that. I mean, it may be more aimed among the advanced countries at you know, R&D and, and a few other sorts of things, but the low income countries that are talking about it, as I was alluding to, they want many of them want a system that would still let them reduce the effective tax rate on certain investments, but not have it get captured by, by the minimum tax, which is essentially, uh, or the, even the um, income inclusion rule minimum tax. And that's really what this would be aimed at. So yes, I mean, clearly it may, or something very like it may wind up having quite a role to play. I guess we'll have to see what transpires. And also, I mean, with that, there's sort of a question of, you know, should you, there's tax sovereignty, and then there's like telling people they should eat their vegetables, and they shouldn't have these tax incentives, because they really need the tax base. But, you know, it's very hard to say that to people if they feel they have to compete with each other for direct foreign direct investment. So, yes, I think is the short answer to that question that I gave a long answer to. Thanks, Vicky. And I, I should disclose, I, I, I went for, so Conrad is Maltese, fellow Maltese. I, I kind of cheated by going to him first. Um, but there's another more technical question, which I guess um, Akeem might be directed to you, um, but see if other people will be willing to answer it by Peter Merrill. 
And so Peter asks quite a technical question, I guess, which is how would the under tax payment rule apply if companies sell to an independent foreign distributor? I mean, the under tax payment rule requires there to be a group entity where you can deny a deduction, right? So, so that's the basic starting point. Um, so if there is no related party in that jurisdiction, I don't think we can deny a deduction. I think in most groups, you would find deductions, but it's not exactly the same as the income inclusion rule that in some sense, you know, picks up all the income, you know, subject to the carve out. Or so. Um, so that's probably the answer. Okay, um, so moving on from these more technical questions to uh, uh, something which I've been struggling with and it follows on from the comment which Mike Williams made, which is sequencing. And um, so maybe I haven't got my head around it well, but so countries are now sit sitting around the table trying to agree on a set of rules, but they're not quite sure if those set of rules will be um, agreed on by Congress. So uh, if I understood this right, this is where we are. So, so how do, if I'm a country sitting around the table, how do I agree to rules if I'm not sure that uh, the US will ultimately implement this uh, through, you know, because Congress might not agree to it. Did I, is it me who misunderstood this or is this a, seems like quite a problem. Is everyone too polite to say I misunderstood it, Akeem? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's not a problem from the US side. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I should, I should think you could do, I should think you could do some sort of contingent agreement, but maybe I'm just being too much of a lawyer there, which I actually am. Um, so, you know, say, assuming this is the position the US will wind up taking, then we agree to do this. But like, you know, sort of like the way the DSTs have been at, only not the same, but they were, some of them were introduced contingently, um, like the UK's, like we'll take it away if we can reach an agreement. So I suppose one could do that, but I can't really think of much other way to address that problem. Sorry, Akeem, was you were shaking your head? I'm not sure, if, did I misunderstand this? No, 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 I think it's, it's just too much light coming in, so you probably can't see You're it. making me jealous, yeah. <laughs> it's the dark side of the sunny side of the OECD. Um, <laughs> no, I think, you know, I think it's, it's just a normal situation. Like, you know, governments can agree and they can come to Paris and agree and then parliaments decide. And that's the case in the US. And yes, there's parliamentary systems, as Mike has explained, that, that where this may be different, but that is just democracy in some sense. And so we need to cater for that. There have been agreements that have been signed and not ratified, and that's that's the process. Um, and, and I guess, as Vicky says, you need to think about some of the dynamics that you can bring in. Uh, you know, we've been discussing a guilty grandfather, and as Mike says, a guilty grandfather looks different depending on where guilty is or where guilty might be. And so I think we just need to work through this, but that is not impossible. Um, and, and you can see it in DSD examples and there's other examples. So, you know, I think that's a reality. It's a reality, not just in the US, it's a reality also in other countries that we need to work with and where we have approaches, how we can think that through and, you know, translate it at the end, recognizing that that's the result of a democracy. I guess on that last question as well, John, I mean, there's a time consistency of policy making. So if, if the US is now the market maker in this globalized taxation world, you would take a look at some kind of algorithm to say, well, it lurches to unilateralism back to multilateralism, numbers 12, numbers 21. You know, people might start to make heuristic rules as to where the parameters are likely to be. And it seems to me, you know, from listening to the conversation today, um, it's, it's somewhere in the mid to high teens is where people are using those kind of heuristics. Ooh, so um, your comment, Danny, invites me. So we, we're at the end of our time, but I'd like to, um, following on from your comment, ask you all to, um, you know, either make a prediction on whether you think in a few months we will get agreement uh, on pillar two, and if so, what do you think the rate will be? So Danny is uh, kind of thinking about high teens. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable 
and looking at a uh, crystal ball, you know, you can just make any final comments uh, that you'd like to make on anything that has been said thus far. Um, so Mindy, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking that I'm like Pascal who gets paid for being an optimist. I, I get paid for being a, a skeptic. Uh, so, uh, but I, I do think that there will be some agreement reached because I, I do agree that I, I do also think that countries want to reach an agreement that they, they view it as important for ensuring stability. Uh, but I do think that will be an agreement in the very broadest uh, sense uh, with a lot of flexibility for countries to accommodate uh, their own domestic uh, needs and, and also the realities as you were just pointing to the, the timeline and, and, and other countries acting in different ways. And would you have a go at guessing at what rate it would be, um, Mindy? Oh, um, I guess would be that it would leave the rate blank. <laughs> when I say in the broadest sense, I mean at the, in the very, very broadest sense. Okay. We agree in principle that every country should operate to, uh, to mandate, to require an inclusion. Thanks, Mindy. Uh, Vicky? Well, to carry on the analogy, I probably get paid for not getting out ahead of the process here. But um, I can say, I said I was speaking for myself and I have been, but I will say, as everybody probably who knows who reads the paper, the IMF, IMF management is very, putting a lot of weight and talking a lot about the importance of reaching a multilateral agreement. So we as an institution do think that's really important. I don't wanna predict what it will be Personally, I do tend to be an optimist, so I guess I'd agree with Mindy something, and Mindy and Pascal. I think something will happen. Um, rate? I'll go way out on a limb here and say it probably won't be above 21%. Um, but I think that's about as far as I'd go. Thanks, thanks Vicky. Uh, Danny, any final comments? Yeah, I think... Um... Well, I, I was just worried my backdrop would fall away, revealing the Paradise Island to match Mindy's, um, <laughs> that, that is Ireland. Um, but the, um, I think that, you know, a round number, uh, like 12.5%, um, but no, I would think something like um, somewhere around the order of 15, if you go on the heuristics that I talked about, would seem to be um, a basis of attraction, let's put it that way. Thanks, Danny. And uh, Akeem, you have the final word. But if we, we agree, like the IMF, the OECD, Mindy and, and Danny, then, you know, I'm not going to stand in the way of that. So we'll certainly have an agreement. Plus, I mean, Pascal has already said that. So who am I to ever contradict? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, you probably get least from me because, you know, I am actually an optimist just as much as you have to be an optimist in this job. Echo what uh, Vicky says. Um, so I think countries want to deal. I think also countries have sufficient self-interest to want to deal, which is always what you need to actually get a deal. Um, and then, you know, I'm not going to venture, I guess, on the raid. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mindy, Danny, Vicky, Akeem, and particularly grateful to Akeem to be willing to uh, field some of the more technical uh, questions directed at him. So thank you all very, very much. And now we'll move to the very final uh, bit of the conference. So um, I'll invite uh, Mike, Debra to come back on and uh, say a few uh, words to wrap this up. So Mike, I think your idea was, we thought you could say a few final thoughts about uh, where we are and where we're going. Yes, okay. And um, thanks very much to all the, uh, the panelists in the last panel, which uh, I learned a lot from. Um, so I thought the idea here was that um, maybe I could just wrap it with some kind of very broad points. So I don't want to get into any of the details uh, of, of any of the reforms really. But I, I thought it might be useful just to kind of look at, you know, finally at the big picture. And I have five propositions to make, you know, which people may think are either obvious or wrong, um, but let me make them and see where we go. So the first kind of obvious proposition is whatever is agreed now is a compromise. We're not re restarting a, uh, from first principles. So, 
that's kind of obvious. We have 139 members of the inclusive framework. Uh, the OECD is trying to build a consensus from all those 139 members. It's not even a vote, you know, not even a vote by a two thirds majority. It's a consensus. And that's in a, in a situation where countries have different interests. They believe they have different interests. At least they have different perceptions of their interests. Um, so it's almost inevitable that we're going to have a compromise uh, based on those different views and that it's going to go in different directions. And that's, you know, that's exactly what we are seeing happening. So I, I think, you know, honestly, I think congratulations are due to Pascal Akim and, and, their, and their teams for getting us this far um, and, you know, making it possible that there could be some compromise. I, you know, from an academic perspective, I want to say, what I really like to do is go back to first principles and say, what is it that we're trying to do here? Can we do that? This, um, this is what we do in our book, but I kind of fully recognize that that's, you know, the, the, the problem of the OECD is very different to that. So that's, that's my first uh, statement. My second statement is everything is changing, uh, but nothing is changing. And I think that's a characterization of the proposals on the table, actually. Um, so arguably, this is the most fundamental change in the international system of taxing profit in a century. Uh, it's moving away from that 1920 compromise of source and reverence, uh, residence. It's also to some extent moving away from the arm's length principle. We're introducing more elements of former apportionment. So that, you know, that's all pretty radical. It's moving in the direction of the market country and the parent country. But all of those proposals are grafted on top of the existing system. You know, the, the idea is let's keep the existing system and put other stuff on top. Um, and that creates, you know, that's creates some difficulties because, you know, for example, you know, the pillar one is giving market rights to the market country, but then we have to take it away from somewhere else. So I think in, in a way, I think that kind of this point that nothing is changing stems from the first point, which is a compromise. You know, it's always easier with, with 139 members, the status quo is always the most likely outcome. So I think we're, you know, we're edging towards the status quo plus stuff rather than the, any kind of radical restructuring. I think my third point is that reform and action is actually fundamentally a response to powerful economic forces. I think it's easy to, you know, when we're thinking about what's going to happen next week or what are the negotiations going to be like, we think, well, this is driven by politics. You know, what does the Biden administration think? You know, what do the UK think or Ireland think? Um, but actually there are powerful economic forces which are driving us to have this debate in the first place. You know, there's public concern about profit shifting, which has enabled multinational companies to put profits into low tax jurisdictions. There's competition over tax rates, which has driven down tax rates substantially over the last two or three decades. There are differences in tax rates, which drive the changes in the location of real economic activity. And that's something the Biden administration now seems particularly focused on with the idea of American jobs moving abroad. There's huge complexity, uh, which you know, creates its own costs and, and uncertainty. So I think you know, those powerful economic forces are not gonna go away unless there's a kind of re a fundamental redesign of the international tax system. And I think that's fundamentally what is driving us. And any long-term solution to the tax system is gonna to have to cope with those kind of problems. So my fourth statement, I have a caveat to, and I've been discussing with, well, with, with you, John. Um, so my statement is, this is not the end of the reform, it's just the beginning. Um, and the reason I say that is that economic, these economic forces will not go away. The, the things which have driven us, driven 139 countries to the table to think about taxing in the place of the market, which I see as a kind of relatively immobile place because the consumer is not going to move away. Um, those economic forces are not going to go away. And in a, if we only move slightly in the direction of the market, for example, um, if with pillar one, then I think there'll be pressure in the future to move more further in that direction. But I think the same is true of pillar two. You know, we could move to a 10% a, a threshold rate or a 15% or a 21% rate, but all of those things are kind of up for grabs in terms of um, the debate. I think if we go back to the BEPS project, you know, I think we had a two year BEPS project. Um, and at the beginning of that, I think people thought, well, at beginning and end of that indeed, people thought, this is a great project. We know we've done a great deal. We've kind of, we've now done, we've sort of tried to fix these problems. And you know, two years later or one, two, three years later, we're back at the table 
you know, reinvestigating things because the BETS project didn't fundamentally address all of those, all of those economic fundamentals. Um, so my caveat to that is actually where I started, you know, actually international consensus is very difficult to achieve. You know, it may be that Pascal and Akim are successful now, it will be difficult to achieve inter international consensus again in the future. But I think those uh, powerful economic forces will not go away. And so my, my final point then is, I think we have on the table two very interesting, but very different reforms. Um, and I think in a sense, they, if we, if we really think long-term, uh, you know, where are those two reforms directing us? I think we can think of there being essentially two alternative worldviews for the long run. So worldview one is we have a highly coordinated system with an agreed minimum rate. Um, that's our pillar two approach, you know, as uh, implemented by the Biden administration, really, or as proposed by the Biden administration. I think there's still within that at the moment, we still there are still likely to be disputes, as Mike Williams said, about um, you know which country receives the revenue. There may be incentives to countries, single countries, to go it alone to undercut others. You know, we've talked about all of those kind of things. I think ultimately that's moving us in the direction of much more coordination than we have now. If we have a minimum tax rate, why don't we just go further? Why don't we just have a single international world tax, you know, administered by a world tax authority? I, you know, I can hear people laughing and saying that's crazy. No, that will never happen. But I think, you know, many of the things that we're seeing happen, happening now, we wouldn't have dreamt about 10 years ago. Um, the key problem there is clearly one of sovereignty, but that's al already come up, certainly in the context of pillars one and pillar two. I think that's one direction. The other direction we might get, you know, of, of fundamental and long-term reform is if we can design a system which doesn't impose costs, you know, one country imposing costs on another. What economists talk about as being negative spillovers or externalities. You know, what we have at the moment is that we do have such a system. If the UK reduces its tax rate, that puts pressure on other countries to reduce their tax rates as well. I know there are foes of investment as a result of the way that we tax at the moment. But that's not inevitable about taxes. That, by and large, that is not true of VAT, for example. Um, so to the extent to which we can have taxes which are levied where some immobile factor is located, which could be a consumer or user, it could ultimately be the shareholder, um, then actually we may move to a system where you know, these, this international coordination is actually less required, actually may not be required at all. We don't actually need a coordination on VAT rates. Um, if we design the corporation tax system in that way, we wouldn't really need co much coordination on, on corporation tax rates either. So those are my thoughts on, on where we are and thinking long term. So I think, you know, where we have, we have on the table proposals that they both keep the existing system and take tentative steps, but they take tentative steps in, in, in two very different directions simultaneously. I'm not sure where we're going to end up, but I'm reasonably sure that this process has quite a long way to go yet. Thank you. Let me hand back to you, John, to, to wrap up. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we're um, we're at the end of our time, so um, you know clearly we're, this is an incredibly important uh, time uh, in the in the history of the international tax system, and uh, you know the weeks ahead promise to be challenging but also um, exciting and definitely very important. So I'd like to thank all our speakers, uh, Pascal, Akim, Tim, Danny, Vicky, and everyone else. Um, I'd like to thank Jenny for organizing the for organizing the administrative part of the of the online seminar. We will put the videos online eventually, and I'd like to thank uh, the participants who stayed with us for these uh, three and a half hours. I think the high point I saw about 560 participants or so, so uh, that's been great. Um, so all I have to say is. You know, have a pleasant evening. I'm about to stand in a cold, wet field watching my seven-year-old play football. I hope you all have a much more pleasant evening ahead of you. Thank you very much.